Welcome to Chess on the Brain with National Master David Bennett. Let's get into some Steinitz games. Let's look at a world championship match featuring Wilhelm Steinitz. And the thing about Steinitz is Bobby Fischer said it's really important to study him in addition to Paul Morphy. So hey, if Fischer says it's important to study Steinitz, I'll take his word for it. He is one of the players that helped create Fischer. Uh, into what he became. So I think it's good to study him. And the interesting thing about science is that he's known for sort of creating a scientific method that you can apply to chess. Some people have some issues with that, saying, hey, that's not always applied. Things are more fluid than that. But still, it's really important to see what science did for chess. He was monumental in the development of chess and its progression throughout the you know late 19th century and into the 20th century, where, where chess really just took off. So he became world champion in the late 1800s. So we have here this match between Steinitz and Zuckerberg. This is the official match. He also played Anderson, and Anderson was kind of considered an unofficial world champion, or at least he was the top of the world, just as Morphy was. So he had a lot of unofficial world champions, but then Steinitz became the first official world champion with this match. So I want to dig into it with you. Let's just study it. This is actually part of my studying as well. I'm preparing for the Philadelphia Open next week. There's going to be a lot of um, really strong players, a lot of GMs and IMs there. So I'm looking forward to competing in that, trying to work towards the beating master title. Right now I'm the only CM, candidate master, national master title. So I really want to get that FM title and just play some uh, really, you know, I guess some tough players and hopefully play some great chess. So studying games like this, really um, digging into chess history is incredibly helpful, I think. So we got to know our science, we got to know our Lassiter, we got to know our Capablanca, as well as our Kasparov and Natal and our, um, you know, Botvinnik and, and um, all the newer players too, Anand, everybody. It's important to really have, uh, I think, an eclectic understanding of chess masters, of the world champions. So I, I just want to walk through it with you. Let's study this match between Zuckerberg and Steinitz, 1886. It was interesting, so it was in New York, St. Louis, and New Orleans. There was a lot of controversy around when the match was going to be. Science was from present-day Czech Republic, from Prague, Bohemia back then. He was born in 1836. And Zuckertor, I think he was Polish. Um, and so Zuckertor, he, he had a really strong showing in London. When he, he came out of science, so people considered him among the strongest and said, hey, science really better than him. So this was the test. Really interesting match. Look at this. So you have science who won the first game, and then suddenly Zuckerberg wins four in a row. And there, as I mentioned, there were a lot of shifts in where the location was that probably played some role in inconsistency and so forth. Um, but check out this. This is great on chessgames.com. Look at the history. They really take care of it. They have a lot of, a lot of references. So we're just going to play through the games, um, and it's going to be fast. So I'm not going to just, some games I'm going to go in depth. This is how, how I like to prepare for a game when I'm studying uh, world champions and grandmasters. I just like to flip through it. It's, it's like flow. This is uh, the flow of chess. So um, I think let's just, let's just look through all the games and maybe spend several minutes, maybe 10 minutes a game, maybe five minutes, depending on how difficult it is, probably even more than that. But let's just go through the games and see how Steinitz wins against Zuckerberg and became the first official world chess champion in 1886. So, let's see. Okay, looks like that's centralized. So we have opening with D4. So Steinitz is blocked. Why don't we look at it from Steinitz's perspective? I think it's always helpful because we're really trying to understand how Steinitz wins, that's, that's the goal. What are the winning plans he comes up with? How does he approach his opponent? So that, that was important that he, uh, he started this historic match with win. So we got D4, D5. Traditional, we have the Queen's Gambit, and he plays the Slav defense with C6, E3. So you can see it's, it's very traditional, the way they open it. But people still do that nowadays. You'll see Carlson play a very similar opening today. I mean, you block your bishop right here. You block the bishop, but the bishop will often come out later after the knight comes here. The bishop goes here, the knight will come here. And then eventually you get that break in on e4, and the bishop could come out. 
Bishop F5, getting the bishop outside the pawn chain after black closes it with e6. Reasonable. Knight c3, e6. So we're creating that famous slob setup. I think of it like the iron triangle. It's very good opening. And notice that since he has his bishop outside the pawn chain, he's not going to have those typical problems associated with the bishop being locked within it. They just see a lot of queen's pawn structures where white just gets that, that lasting edge, superior pieces, slightly superior pawn structure. But here that's not an issue. Knight f3, knight d7. Interesting. Interesting that he went, I'm thinking, why did he go? I'll just tell you what I'm thinking along the way, how I'm, how I'm approaching it. So I said, why did he go knight d7 instead of knight f6? Hmm. It seems that he wants to um, really take a look at e5, I'm thinking. Yeah, and you'll see that. So immediately after a3, a bit slow, but maybe um, white stops the bishop and anticipates some queen side expansion. Now you see bishop d6. Yeah, so it seems that Steinitz really doesn't want soccer to stick his knight on e5. So he's preventing that. c5. Uh, I don't know about that move. I don't know about that move. And again, this was early. Not, not super early in chess, but, but, but still, it was you know well over 100 years ago. So theory has evolved a lot since then, and, and Steinitz helped to evolve that. But generally speaking, you don't want to push that pawn too early. Because, because you're giving, giving up tension on the d5 square, on the d5 pawn. And once you give up that tension, well, it suddenly goes back. And now you're going to see this e5 come. And I think I've seen this game before. This is all the first. I'm just playing through this. This is fresh. I haven't looked at these recently. But I've seen several of his games. I think Fisher looked at like all of his games. So let's try to do that. Um, but, but you can see that e5 is going to come, particularly because he's already got that control of e5. And that's favorable for Steinitz, I think. Sure, Zakator gets queen side. Queen side space, but Stein is going to center where it matters, and he immediately does it. Yeah, this is a really beautiful game that he starts with. So you can see that white is the one with the bishop on b2 getting trapped behind his pawn structure. Well, well potentially, sorry, potentially. It depends. For now, but he's hoping that it's going to open up here. Let's see how it goes. There you go. So Stein says, I see what you're trying to do. You want to unleash your bishop? How about no? How about let's shut it down and make sure that that bishop remains a tall pawn, locked within your own position. Knight goes to d2. And now it's almost like black is playing like white in the French defense. It's sort of reversed. But in, if you're playing black in the French defense, you don't really want to push your pawn. It's very rare. Sometimes they ruin the pawn structure. But your only hope now is to, is to break on the queen side. It's so slow. And, you, you know, you're going to be in trouble in the sense, in, in, on, on the king side. Of course, black wants that f5, f4 break. Get some peace activity on the king side as well. It's got to go up to the break where his pawns are aiming. And since white's pawns are aiming this way toward the queen side, he wants the b4, b5 break, traditionally speaking. White might go for a crackle here, but anytime you play f3, you weaken e3. So keep that in mind. Pawns is a soul of chess, as Bill Brooks said. That pawn structure is going to be so important. Interesting. He goes to h5. He's gaining king side space, possibly anticipating some, some sacrifices or um, some play over that. For example, if he castles right away, if white castles right away, he'll be subjected to the classic bishop sacrifice. With the bishop takes pawn, followed by knight check. If the bishop takes pawn takes, and that opens up the rook, yeah, it's, it's going to be made. So he can't allow that, which is why he plays h3. But h3 is also kind of the weakness. Now you can imagine maybe a bait at attack with g5, g4. Like if, white, if white commits to castling uh, on the king side. So knight goes to f8. Okay, and then uh, black goes up at knight, white goes to a4, preparing that b5 expansion. Now the knight on f8 is going to be able to move closer to the action over here on the king side where black pieces are aiming, pawns are aiming that way. So generally speaking, you want to play where your pawns are aiming. Now knight can go to g6 and then h4, hitting g2. I like that maneuver. He can also go to e6 and then to g5, some options. Maybe hitting h3, preparing sacrifices. I'm seeing lots of rich sacrifice ideas on any one of these squares, g2 or h3. There he goes, knight g6 to h4, I think. Okay, he gets his break in, but it's not a huge initiative. He, he, black isn't really forced to do anything. 
If you need to sit on that, let you take, I take back on C6. Okay, he goes to G2 immediately. Put in question to, to White. What do you need to do about your pawn? Oh, well, you play G3, but it's, it's a weakening move. The light square has become incredibly weak now. H3 becomes weak. I'm liking black here a lot. Probably a big advantage. Interesting. So he's really preparing, I think, some kind of peace sacrifice. Now you can see that with G2, he's hitting E3. So even though White never played F3, he still might get attacked on those dark squares. They're still subject to attack. We've got a bishop here, right out here. You can sack a knight or a bishop and take the other one. For example, we take this one on G3, takes back, knight can take. It gets messy. Plus you have H4 ripping open G3 potentially. I think a peace sack. Yeah, this is a famous game actually. Beautiful the way he gets it. He facilitates with the bishops. So knight takes e3, pawn takes, bishop takes g3. Yeah, I showed this to my student a couple of years ago. So king goes to g2, and it just goes back. Just play it calm. No need to freak out. You're up on. I mean, you're down a piece or two pawns, so you're down like a point. But look at this. The king is subjected to this. Onslaught by the bishops, the knights coming, the queens coming, the rook might lift up. It's just a long term attack. Plus, you have the structural attack on e3 that's always weakness on e3. Meanwhile, show me black's weaknesses. I talk about that a lot. That having a solid position enables you to attack. It's like long, a long term advantage. You don't have to worry about your own weaknesses. Just, just hack away your opponent's position safely. Sure, small price to pay. It's worth it. Rook okay, six. There we go. Now we got four pieces, and the queen's coming, aiming at the king. Plus the pawn could help. Very dangerous. King f one. Common sense. Bring in the rook with tempo on the queen. Ooh, yeah. The queen is lined up with the king. If we can get our rook on there, we can win something. This is looking good. Force the piece to interpose on f three, perhaps. We can even go bishop g three and invade. Queen d7, just immediately attacking. And as you can see, it's just the weak squares, the weak pawns. It's, it's too much to handle, I think. Takes, okay. No, no real relief. Keep your pawns chained strong. Of course, white wants to attack the pawn chain base. No problem. The initiative is too strong here. Okay, now we've got three pawns for a piece. We have material, material parity and huge initiative on the king side. Massive. Look at these pieces all in flux. Beautiful. King e1. I want to get my bishop on g3. Knight g4. Okay, now we're attacking the queen and hitting e3. You want to give up something for it? If you give up that bishop, you're really going to weaken your line squares. Yeah, of course. Where's your king going to go now? We created a mating net with our bishop. Plus a pawn. Plus his own pawn. So these guys are all sort of clogged up. Sure, he can move his knight and go to d2, but by then we might infiltrate and get on the 7th rank. Let's see how he does it. I'm curious, what's, what's the precise technique? Clearly, black has some, a huge attack here, but you have to execute. Knight d2. So the knight wants to perhaps go to f4. Not g3, because you'll probably get with h4, but f4 kind of. Hoping to clog things up. And if you go to f4, you get with rook f6 and g5 stuff. It's not pleasant for white here. Zucker to force in the heat. Interesting. Queen e7, where's he going? g5, probably. Make a make a shift to g5, hitting e3 seems natural. Oh, plus he prepares h4. You could just ram the h pawn now. Plus, when you go h4, you secure g3. I really would like to get it. If we can deal with this knight, get on to g3 with the bishop will be really nice. Okay, so the knight hits it. He goes to h6. That's a bit, seems weird. I mean, the natural, by natural inclination, we could play to f6. So it's understand why we make such a move. I'm sure there's been books written about it, but um, with, with deep analysis on the game. But we're just trying to understand it. Sometimes, sometimes that's more important. Um, and, and I'm just like, let, let science be the teacher. We may not understand every little detail, but we see the flow again. So the flow of the game. Understanding the ideas come up again and again. How does he win? Rook F6. Why not Rook F6? 
I don't see why not. Why are you rook h6? Either way, we can play g5. If you play rook h6, one of the benefits, well, there's two benefits. One is that you can push the h pawn, or you have to worry about that. Two is you can play g5 in addition to f5. So if we're really going with the with pawn storm theme, then we'd like to clear the way, and then perhaps come back to f6 and really break in with f4. Hmm. So there, there's a reason for that. Now, if you go with f6, obviously you're going to lose queen away because you're about to lose his knight g5 to get the piece back with some, with some interest with those pawns. So rook f6, let's say, I don't know, ah, queen h4, queen h4. I think that's the reputation, or the reason they didn't like it. So if you go with rook f6, try to imagine queen a. I'm not going to do it. I guess there's no side lines here because I'm not going to, you know, I can't make up. Or can I? I could, I could. But you can just imagine if I go with rook f6, queen h4. Why don't we play that? And now it's, uh, it's just problematic. You know, the, the knight is hitting this. You don't know, you can't get your g5 in. You don't really want to move your queen away. You can't get, yeah, we want g5. And I don't want to trade queens. I want to mate. I want to get a middle game checkmate here. And, and meanwhile, that bishop is, is terrible on b2. The rook hasn't come up. Yeah, the pieces are just superior for black. Maybe rook b8. No, the only thing that's not in the game is the rook. But yeah, yeah so queen h4 ties things up. up. We don't need that. That's, I think that's the reason, if I had to guess. So we have rook h6 instead. See, it's good. Okay, the bishop's hoping for life. Clearing the b files well. Maybe rook b1. G5, of course. Let's roll those, let's roll those pawns. We've got three pawns coming. Dynamic, incredibly dynamic. In addition to the bishop here, which is just dominating the center and king side and shooting, yeah, shooting from the center, from the king side into the center, continuing to restrict the enemy king. So the knight went back to where it came from, didn't achieve anything. Ah, so he didn't want to five after all. Maybe later on to do that. I mean, F5, F4 is attractive at some point. If we need it. It's always on tap. But, Rook F6. Now I'm looking at infiltration on F3. I would I still want that. I want that bishop to enter somehow. Maybe it enters on H2 or something. We'll see. Okay, well, obviously it's not going to happen anytime soon. But, where do we go now? Queen. Uh, we got to push those pawns. Ah, wow. What a bold move. Well, it, it's actually, it, it's not even a sacrifice. Because the knight takes, pawn takes, forking these two pieces, and the queen of the knight, and you, you end up getting um, two knights for the rook. Plus, you get your pawn moving from e4 to f3 to e2. Beautiful. So you're actually clearing the e5, like exposing e3, and then maybe we play king d7 or something, and rook to e8. In a closed position, it's interesting. A lot of French-type position. You can stick your king in the center. Mainly, you want to get your king on the sides when the center is open. When the center is closed, it's generally a rare exception. It's, just, it's generally an exception that you can um, keep your king in the center. So, but, but it's rare because usually something will open up in the center. Or if it's not open now, we'll find a way. For example, after it takes, it takes. Well, now it's semi open. It's starting to open. And you can imagine like a 5 f 4, bam, the whole thing cracks open. White position explodes. It explodes open. Okay, now that's one. Hoping for defense, hoping to cover the dark squares. He's just hanging on there. Obviously, he didn't want to take it to the rook. Um, positionally and materially. I'm thinking maybe rook b8. Can the rook get on b8 and help out? Yeah. Rook b8, okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you begin to maximize, like, like I'd say, uh, I am the burner talking when I was hungry. Maximize your pieces. So, we maximize the rook, we maximize the bishop. Pretty much maximize this until we have a chance to maximize it further. And we'll maximize this as much as we can. The queen's waiting to maximize herself. Maximize the pawn. Everything is maximized. So we get maximum value for each piece, which really ends up making a piece where, for example, knight on the sixth rank is basically maximized. Well, if you got a knight on the sixth, or knights, they say it's worth the rook sometimes. If it's anchored in there, it's strong. So you, it, it becomes exponential, so much more powerful when you maximize it. Okay, so, so he's doing that idea of king d2. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like it's over for white. I'm, I'm liking f5, especially now that the rook's in front of the pawn. I'm really liking f5 and f4. Okay. 
a a five. Let's do it four, yeah. Let's do it. Okay, I agree. I've seen this game before. So I'm kind of I'm exposed to the ideas already. But this is just thematic. You have your positive in this way. You want that five four break. But it's it's instructive how science found a way to first get its pieces in, infiltrating, and then have five that four. So, I mean, again, White's trying. He's trying. But I don't know about that move. I mean, he's just blocking your bishop further. It's, White doesn't have anything to do with it. Okay. He breaks in. Now we're really applying pressure here. And potentially we can uh, rip open the F file. Maybe, maybe penetrate on F2 and build trade. That would be great. Maybe Queen or perhaps, again, the King move somewhere, like King D7 and Rook. F8. For now, though, I like my rook on B8. Uh, we gotta like our rook there, um, which can create some more accommodative possibilities. So again, maximizing each piece. But you have, as such as that tactics flow from the superior position. So we really, um, this is a right for tactics, right about now in the next few moves. We'll probably see some tactics soon. Well, rook F3 was already a tactical possibility that it couldn't take it. It was, it was, posi it was positional domination rooted in tactics that will lead to further tactics. I, I believe that tactics and um, tactics and positional play are, 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 are you know this is close close they're close to tie. There's, there's a marriage between the two. Okay. So we get queen f7 and now he's thinking about taking the rook f2 of course. There you go. Okay. Well it's really uncomfortable with the queen now. You gotta get your essential rook on this on their second rank like seven. Yeah, it's just utter domination. Beautifully done. Um, and I'm feeling some tactics. There's got to be something coming soon. We're really infiltrating and beginning to maximize. Seeking maximum value. White pieces are tied up. The king is exposed, pinned up by the knight's pin. Something's going to go down. What? Queen takes. Oh, does it, it looks like it looks like they trapped the, the queen almost. Let's see. Is white in for a rude awakening? Or does black just have a superior endgame? So we take back. We have three, four, five, six against three. So again, white um, white is up a piece, but black has three pawns for the piece. So it's actually materially equality. And black has three pass pawns, one protected, two connected. That's looking good. It's got the bishop here. Can you just play an endgame here? No, no, it's, it's not, not even, it's even trapped. Because if you, you can't move your E rook because the knight falls, if you move that rook to F1, H rook to F1, you can go to H2. Let's see how this goes down. Oh, he takes this one first. Can we throw in a bishop check? Yeah. Throw in a bishop check. That looks, that looks appealing. Do we take back? Okay. So we've we opened up the line of the rook to check. It's guard, the, the rook's guarded though, there's no skewer. Um, and you can see, sometimes when you trade off pieces, the attack becomes more decisive, actually. Because there are a few pieces in white position to hold, to hold off the attack. Yeah, I, I, I think that they're just down material. We have a bishop for a bishop, a rook for a rook, a knight and a, a rook for a queen. That's eight for nine. Queen is usually stronger than those two, except unless it's a rare circumstance. And then black just has past pawns and extra pawns. Yeah, it's, it's winning. winning. It's winning. Let's, let's, let's see, see the finish. Okay. He doesn't want to trade, trade that. that. Oh, well, of course, if you do trade. No, check. He only the rook again. The rook's going to hang on you one. So he just likes, I think he likes the, the game of tempo. This reminds me of a Morphe game where he plays this and then he gets a check on the diagonal. So maybe he's going to get that. Yeah. You come here, you get queen e4 check. OK, we get the king d7. Maybe the king can infiltrate. If you start checking, then just go to f5, e4, f3 if he wants to. OK, so the bishop takes. What's going on? Is there some trick we're not seeing? What, is he hoping for, like, some mating idea with, like, the rook? No. Can't be anything there. Just go back. There's nothing. I mean, he's probably about to rerun, right? 
Yeah. yeah. And yeah. <laughs> there, there we go. go. Well, that, that was, was predictable, predictable in a lot of ways. ways. Um, just to filter the pieces, pieces, smash the F file open, and, and win. win. Interesting. Interesting. I like it. That was a nice game. It's a famous game, I think. Okay. So let's go back. Let's, I, I spent a little more time on that game. That was a rich game. Well, now, now Steins loses four times in a row. Wow, you guys are revenge for, for some time. And then they got... And then I think they switched locations again. And then Stein starts winning. You got, then he gets three and a half out of four. So then, so basically they're tied at that point. They both have four wins and they have a draw. Wow. Okay, well, I think to do it justice, let, let's just flip through those games. Let's see. This is probably part of the formative experience for Stein. It is. Just like I talk about. Um, Karpov and Kasparov, and Karpov at first beating Kasparov, beating part of Kasparov's formative experience. I want to get more into those matches too, super important matches. Okay, so Steins is white. Well, who should we look at? Should we look at it from the, the winner's side? Let's, uh, let's look at him. I want to look at him from Steins. Zuck retorts. He gets his retort for sure. Okay. Let's, I'm just going to flip through these. Just look at the patterns if you want. You can rewind. Look at it yourself. On chessgames.com or any other site, like 365chess.com. Okay, he plays the scotch. Interesting. So, knight f6. I don't, I don't know the theory on this. I don't know whether you're supposed to take and play e5. I imagine taking is a, a powerful option here. And then if they take back, you get the, you get the king side majority of 4 against 3. And black gets double pawns. So maybe theory has improved. I'm sure it's improved since then. Because I think now you're mostly seeing, I think, bishop c5 stuff. And queen, and then bishop b3, queen f6, something like that. Not f6. Or even now that you can still play bishop c5. Maybe you can have knight b3. Or just bishop b3. So let's see. Knight f6, knight c3. Well, this. It reminds me of a lot of lines in Sicilian also, like the conjuration. Get that quick push to b4, and now we're really putting pressure here on e4. How does Stein handle that? Well, apparently, let's see if it was the opening that accounted for the loss or not, or contributed to the loss. Okay, interesting. So, Zakator plays in an uncompromising manner. He says, no trades of queens. I'm gonna, I got the bishop pair. This, the c6 pawn might actually help me get the d5 thrust in. Maybe bishop. So maybe that that way. If I play d6, it probably just play d6. Maybe bishop b7. A lot of times, see bishop a6. I don't see that happening here with bishop f1. Um, first of all, he says, "What are you going to do about your?" Yeah, I'm liking black here already. I mean, this pawn is really under, threat, under pressure. Oh, sorry, I think I mentioned bishop. There's no bishop there. But yeah, but black just has pressure and, and he's supported in the center to play d6 or d5. Let's see what he chooses to do. So, Steinus, Steinus goes to bishop d3, immediate d5. Rapid initiative. He's just seizing the initiative right away. Takes, takes. Well, I mean, this is just back nice to black again. He's just undoubling his pawns, he's got the center, c5 is coming if he needs it, or even c6 to solidify. Um, you could say white's a little more solid. Theoretically, these this push, you know, there's some weaknesses in black's position, split pawns and so forth. Uh, so theoretically, from a pawn structure perspective, white's a little more solid. It's a, it's a relatively open game. We only have one center pawn here. Um, the bishops are free to roam. So it's going to become a, I'm sure, a very tactical battle. Uh, a lot of central control, fighting central control here. Active thesis for both sides, and I Bishop G5 is in the works, I think. C6, yeah, so you're for C6. I was thinking C5 is almost like hanging pawns. Usually, hanging pawns, you don't have a C pawn, though, and they can both be attacked. But C5 just felt a bit too loose, especially if Bishop takes and Knight takes D5, possibly. So he, he went the solid path, and it apparently paid off. Where is the um, where is black light square bishop going to go? I'm thinking it might go to e6. Just trying to think of it's important to think of setups. It's an important setup for you. Um, at this point, the bishop might even go back to d6 and create some mating ideas. 
Maybe bishop e6 and d6. Let's see what he does. So after knight e2, oh, I'm looking at knight g3 to f5, or even h5. So the knight g3 maneuver is interesting. Or even knight d4. So knight, knight d2 seems to be a, um, a productive move for the knight. What was he doing? Yeah, he was sort of controlling e4, but now that you've been a knight, you don't need to really worry about knight jump right now. If he plays a6, you just drop back to go g5. Knight g3. Yeah, immediately. And, and it's defensive as well. You're blocking the bishop and maybe even bishop f5 or knight f5. Immediate threat is knight. Even though, even though the knight f5 bishop here, possibly f4, bishop check. I don't know, it gets messy. But I, I feel like any looseness in black's position after c6 to kind of tighten those screws. So yeah, Zakatavar's hey, proven to be a formidable challenger to science. Interesting. Why did he? Oh, well, now that you have your knight, so that was the drawback of knight g3. You can't go back to h4 without losing your bishop. Doesn't look like you get your compensation enough. So instead, he's, um, he has to resort to d2. e3 might get hit at some point by knight g4 or d4. So maybe he'll come back somehow along this diagonal, maybe c3. But you notice he's also just kind of keeping an eye with his vision. I don't know. I think it's approximately equal. It looks approximately equal. I do like black center, though. It might give him some some more chances, in, in attacking chances. But white's still got a lot of pieces. I mean, pink side, he's got the five in the works. Maybe, no. Yeah, queen f3 gets hit by bishop g4. It's not so clear how he responds to bishop g4. It's an annoying move. Oh, the knight comes in. Oh, so he can transfer to e5. Maybe he's provoking a pawn move by white to weaken things. You can imagine a quick h5, h4 or something, seizing on the dark squares. Knight e5 hits e3, and um, maybe it goes to c4. Maybe even an f5 just ram the f pawn down, f5, f4, f3 or something. Oh. Well, he didn't pick his knight, because he's just like, all right, I'm going to threaten mate. Um, and you can see now really the... The, the dark square weaknesses. So now you pretty much have to, well, you have to take and give black a bishop here and an open board, which is good for black, or you have to play h3, weakening g3. In any case, I, I'm starting to feel some advantage for black. So should he have played h3 here? Was the knight takes up two? No, I don't think so. Knight takes, takes. Queen h4. Maybe. Queen f3. It gets messy, but you can see that these dark squares are the focal points, as Vukovic talks about in the art of attacking chess. So we're already seeing these, these two pawns, f2, h2, in some cases, even, even though g3 looks so solid, if you push one of those pawns, it comes under attack. So China saw that and said, all right, I got to part with my bishop. But now, maybe there's no longer a direct mating attack. But black is probably just better now. I mean, he's solid, he's got the center, he's got the bishop here, king side activity. I'm still feeling something with f5, f4 in some cases. f5, if you provoke f4, that just shuts down white's own bishop. Plus, if we get some of these squares in here. I don't know, I think he might try f5. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe he just does a piece play. Bishop e2, maybe he follows like. The rook coming in, and obviously the knight can't take his mate on h2. So, hmm. Ah, so he finally did, I remember I mentioned that bishop a6 move. That's a useful diagonal. So he finally gets the diagonal. Now notice, this is actually part of a potential mating attack. Since he takes away f1, so Zakator might want to go for a mating attack here. Ah, we get the f1. Yeah, so, it's so appealing. Just like Steinitz did at 4 f 5 now he does it, now Zakator does it. Or sorry, Steinitz did at 5 f 4 Steinitz does the same thing. Zakator does the same thing. Okay. Rook e6. Defensive. Yeah, I gotta think of both sides. Um, gotta work on my announcing skills. Queen to d2. Huh, what's going on there? Hoping for a queen trade with queen to d4, it looks like. The, I'll play the end game with black here. I mean, the end game with the bishop pair, some space. 
I think the end game looks pretty attractive for Black. Yeah, I think he wants Queen D4. What does he do about it? Does he go Bishop C5? No. Oh, he just pushed. Wow. So he got some tactics already. He's already ready for something. So what's going on here? D4. If if Queen takes, then Bishop. No, you can't take here because of eight. What do you? How do you respond to Queen takes? Oh, you just you just trade off, and then you take on G3, and you take the bishop. So it's a pure it's a pure discovery tactic, winning a piece. Since the next, so the turn of the night was not so happy on G3. Bad lesson, um, tough lesson for Spanish. Sometimes it works, but here um, Zakatour beautifully exploited that. So he gets so that's how he stopped Queen D4. He just plays D4, he occupies himself, and you just can't take it. if Bishop takes. You just, just take, take on g3, g3 as well, I think. And then I take back. back. Queen takes now. So the queen will under attack after h takes her. Um, yeah. So, so, so he goes here. He hits the rook. Okay. We just go rook g7. And now we're, we're still guarding d6. No, no, no need to sack the exchange yet. I don't think so. We still have all the advantages for black. Space. Control across the board. Nice bishop there. Now this guy's annoying. But actually, tactically speaking, this rook on d6 might be a liability for white. He needs to double his rooks. What? Takes. Is that is that legitimate? Oh, of course. He went, he's just trying to trade. But somehow it doesn't work. So it looks like Steinitz basically uh, uh, loses the endgame. So he doesn't need to take because he could take either one anytime. Now he wants to take, I think. Look at the space advantage. It gives black incredible mobility. Look at, okay, so one of the imbalances is bishop versus knight. We have a few imbalances here. Um, we have the bishop versus knight, and you can just see the bishop is dominating the knight. We have uh, pawn structure, we have, which gives black, the, the pawn structure gives black space. Again, the, the weaknesses still are still there, theoretically. Like, c6 is a little weak. This is theoretically uh, attackable. That's attackable. So you only have two pawn islands for white. That means they can hold each other together. Fewer weaknesses. Black has three. But that's a moot point here, I think. It's more about the dynamism of the position, the space. Um, Black's position is solid enough, too. And the rook can lift, across, lift and move across the board. The bishop's cutting in. The queen can roam. And white is, is pretty restricted here, that, especially with that knight I'm stuck on g3 still. Um, so, so you add it up, and Black should have a pretty solid, pretty big advantage here. Maybe not winning yet, but with proper technique, can really grow the advantage. I like C5, C4, and then pawn, pass pawn ideas. Okay, so he comes in. So the knight, the knight says, all right, I need to get somewhere. Like uh, Ralston says in uh, the Seven Deadly Chess, since talk to your pieces. What is the knight telling you? He says, I want to go to F4. I want to... I want to get me out of this 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 mess on G3. Let me finally activate. I mean, anything could happen, but I I, my, I would bet on black here for sure. Queen E8, Knight F4, attacking D5. Okay, look what just goes back. No, because he's got the mate threat, so the queen can take. I like that. And again, we can still move our pawn to C5. First contend with this the, the pressure on the E file. There's no immediate threat, I don't think, but it, it's just lasting pressure that's giving Black an, a tremendous initiative here. H4. So he's trying to make it more difficult to dislodge the knight. He hopes for H5. And then you can never dislodge because you take on Passant. Now you could play G5. You'd be opening yourself up. And I think Black's ready for that. Maybe he does. No, first he... Oh, well, the thing is, you're also, yeah, of course, you're, it's a multi-purpose move. You're sort of provoking g5 to support the knight, maybe. Or if he does go g5, you take, take, and then you get knight h3 hitting g5, and you get a roof for your king. So he says, all right, since there's a loof, now this is actually sort of hanging on d4. There's no longer a justification for it to be hanging. So he plays c5. Doesn't, you don't need that pawn. You don't need to get away that pawn. So he gets his h5 in, though, which is good for the knight. Can't. Can't really be dislodged. Probably will play g3 and secure it. Although if you play g3, then you weaken your diagonal for the bishop to come in. So instead, he hits him with c3. 
So he's prepared to get to take back with the pawn, obviously, because he can't move the queen to guard. He's got to guard the knight. How does black respond? Queen B8, interesting. Hitting the knight. See, that's why he may need G3. Hitting B2, hitting, hitting F4. Uh, but again, now you have to worry about bishop B7, and that's open. Queen H1 mating ideas. Ooh, beautiful centralization. And now you can imagine the queen replacing the rook somehow. Like if you take rook takes bishop b7, queen e4, mate on h1. So yeah, that, that diagonal is probably um, what does him in, in addition to the active rook and the, the pawns. Okay, the knight, the knight does something. But is it really working with the rest of the army? No, I don't think so. It's annoying in, in its own right. Now I got to plug in. Um, but not enough. Queen d6 plus h5 is loose. That's what supports. So he has nothing better. He goes back. Interesting. So there's a lot of tactical moves that are being made. So at first he left his pawn. Remember, he just gave away the pawn at d4, it looked like at first. He just hung it there. And then he didn't defend it for a little while. And then he pushes it to d3, ostensibly allowing the, the knight to take it. But why doesn't knight takes work? Let's see if we can figure that out. Knight takes, he looks a bit tied up, but what's the specific refutation? I'm thinking something along the lines of an endgame with the rook and bishop and mating the king almost looks like. So for example, if knight takes, let's see, push, let's say he goes back, check, do we go? Well, if you check and go bishop b7, check, he has f3 at, uh, at, his, at his disposal. Do you go bishop b7 first? He still has f3. Then you have this move. So f3 drops anyway. That's a possibility. Stuff like this is interesting. So maybe he was vying for some kind of endgame there. But again, since he doesn't take it, on the next move he plays c4. Oh, that's interesting. A loose, it's, it's loose, though. Because the pawn can take. I think he's just playing for for some dynamic play here. There's got to be something else after knight takes also. I feel like there's got to be something else. Knight takes. Can we infiltrate somehow? I still think the end game is good for black too. Maybe you have an immediate bishop b7. That diagonal is so weak. So he goes b3, c4, very sharp. So again, he, there's, there's all these, like, seems like you can take something, but he doesn't, it, it never quite works, it seems. If you take, he goes rook b1, opening it up. If you take, probably similar situation now. Hmm, do we take with the bishop? Bishop b7. Let's do it. I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. Let's just let, let it run on Stockfish for a second. This, I don't usually consult the engine, but so it gives black minus 0.69. So black is almost up upon in its view. So after bishop takes c4, f3, rook e7, it doesn't even try to take the pawn. Maybe we'll get too tied up. I would be curious to see how that went though. If he did take it. Okay, let's just let's just do that. So let's say after b takes c4, bishop takes, so let's run this analysis. All you have to do is click on engine, and usually it'll give you an it says in six seconds. So a few seconds it'll show it to you. Oh now it's taking longer. Oh wow, and then it's just a win. Oh wow, wow, the x-rays. You got bishop takes. If queen takes, you got rook check. First of all, it's a deflection, decoy. So if he takes, you take this when you have queen against rook. So when he doesn't take, he moves his king up. Then you just take his rook and you're x-raying through the queen. So I'll show you. I'll play it out real quick. So if you just, it's a simple tactic of, well, it's two tactics. First is offering deflection. And then when the king, so you can't take, you lose the queen. When the king goes up, we just go through x-ray and you win the rook. Game over. That's it. That's a wrap. Okay, cool.
So yeah, there's some deep tactical possibilities embedded in this position. Um, and again, those, those flow from the superior position. So after rook here, to get in the open file, nice prophylaxis. Look at that prophylactic move, getting the king safe. And let's, I'll plug in this after this game. King h2, queen b6. Just work in the geometry of the chessboard. Work in the angles. Look at that. Hitting f2, pinning this. So you can never take anyway, even if you want to now. Beautiful play by, this isn't highly instructed by Zuckertor. So now he, now he shifts because he knows where it's at on that diagonal. He wants queen c6, I think. Yep. Now we're beautiful. He's threatening rook down check. Unleashing the queen discovered attack. Unleashing her to drop on h1 with a mate. Forced mate, actually, after rook e1. If king h2, rook here, or queen, there's mate. So yeah, we, we need the f3 move for, for our Steinitz, but it's ugly. Yeah, it's ugly. So weakening. Everything's loose. He, he's trying to guard the second rank, but now f3 is going to fall, and you got to guard the back rank simultaneously. So he just checks. Don't think the queen wants to block, because you got rook e1 check. That's what happened. G, f3 is going to fall soon. He has to, he has to go. Oh, he, I thought he was going to go king g2. If king g2, then what? What was the reputation there? If, well, king h2, maybe it's similar. He just trades, and he takes. So, wait, what? What's going on here? If he takes, oh, you push the pawn. So, so the pass pawn becomes decisive. So is it similar? If king g2, but, but now it's a little different, huh? Do we have bishop takes check, queen takes, queen down? King g2, bishop takes, if queen, if king takes, that looks terrible. Queen, queen mate, huh, beautiful. Let's play, that's worth playing out. So if king here, if it looks like bishop takes, if queen takes, I think that, is that a mate? No, no, the knight blocks. But you get the, you get the piece back. And then mate, mate's coming, mate's coming. Is this a mate? Uh, yeah. That's it. Beautifully done. Beautifully done by Zuckertor. Well, wait, is this, what if he takes with the queen? Let's make sure this is legit. Yeah, because I, th I think the g1 is going to be hit now. It seems dangerous. But maybe the king goes to h3, for example. Uh, yeah, that doesn't look decisive. Rook check. Same thing. That that pawn's in our way now. The pawn's in the way. Huh. Let, let's do maybe a quick analysis because it's so tactical. So maybe not bishop takes nothing. Well, is there anything else? We want to push the pawn. Do we have any rook sacks on e2 or something? Some, I'm looking for anything here because it's such a tactical situation. Anything could happen. Um, oh. Oh, you just get, you, you can just go rook e3. Oh, where was it? He, in the game, he played king h2. But yeah, if king here, I think we're just going to get, I think we just do that. And we at least collapse uh, f3 with the bishop on it. At least. And we get this, we get the pawn back, continue the attack. That's, that's pretty bad. I think at least we have that. But the bishop sacks were interesting, too. Maybe not quite enough. Okay, so in the game, uh, after king h2, rook, uh, sorry, after rook check, king h2, now he trades and he gets, he still sacks the bishop. And since if you take, you push the pawn up, it's unstoppable. So he charges g4. Okay, well, we got 3, 5, 3, 6. So now black's, black's already earned a pawn for his efforts. And now he just goes to e2. Knight g2. And then he's got a tactic where he's obstructed the rook. So he's able to push and, and queen. It's almost time to resign, I think. Um, does he just take on g4? First he takes this one. 
takes takes. No, no, if you take on g4, oh yeah, I think I think no, I think it's possible because you hit the knight. I like taking on g4. Yeah. Now we got three, four, five against three. H5 is also falling. Plus we're about to we're hitting the knight, getting the queen, so we're winning the piece outright. Just winning the piece. So he he threw in the towel. Okay. This is good stuff. Um, okay, so we're gonna see some more. I'm gonna flip through. I'm gonna try. I, I like to, you know, this is so fascinating. We learn so much from each game, so I'm definitely um, learning a lot myself as I'm as I'm looking through each game and preparing for Philadelphia. Possibly I'll play in the World Open afterwards and see how I feel. But I get a solid nine rounds. A lot of strong players in Philadelphia International, so I, that'll be um, a good one if I can just play that. So I think this is great preparation. Looking at Steinitz games. Um, okay, let's go back. So let's do game three. I mean, in this case, we're kind of looking at how Zakatort, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, Zakatort, how he did well when, um, you know, and we learned from him too. We're, I'll be impartial. At the same time, still knowing that Steinitz also ultimately proved triumph, you know, triumphant, that he was superior. But in these games, Zakatort was superior. Okay, now we have Zakatort as white. All right, let's 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 just look at let's look at it from his side. We're going to look at Zakatort's side for a little bit. So d4, d5. C4, C6. Now he did the same thing Stanis did, I think. Was that the first game? With the slot. Same, I guess this opening was popular with E3 back then. Very, very um, modest, very orthodox approach to this with E3. Nowadays, you'll see more likely uh, Knight C3, Bishop G5, Knight three stuff like that. E3, Bishop F5. This A3 thing again. Oh, so is this right? Is this, this is the same opening they had when uh, the first game? So he's he's hoping to get to make it better. Maybe this time he didn't play c5 and he, he learned his lesson. Let's see. E6. No, he did it again. What are you doing? I guess it worked this time. A5. So he's sort of precluding b4 stuff, preparing b6 undermining this stuff over here, this whole dark square setup. He's trying to undermine that complex in White's position. Queen b3, and I'm sure Steinitz is hungry for a win here. And thinking, thank you for pushing again. But maybe this queen b3 thing was annoying. It's fine, I think. Defends it. I'm seeing a knight maneuver. Maybe knight c3 to a4 hitting b6. Yeah, he saw it too. Um, and, and he, I think he's not going to land there, but he's just going to like keep the option open for a while. Okay, knight goes to e2. Okay, well he did. He did what Steinitz did. So he's saying, "Hey, in your face, you did knight g3 and lost. I'm going to do knight g3 and win. That's that's offensive. That's offensive. Bishop g6. Psychological. Bishop d2." But I don't know. Do it What was the standard move here? Um, I can almost imagine some players trying to play a four and not a three and get a grip on e five. You know, albeit weakening e four, but accepting that compromise. I think. I think really. Um, it reminds me of Kasparov versus Deep Blue game. I think it was against Deep Blue where he uh, just like ended up locking up. Well, actually allowed Deep Blue to play this move, but Kasparov just played on the queen side, and there was there was a lot of maneuvering involved. Um, but he has to make sure he doesn't get made at this time on the king's side. I mean, he, e5 is going to come again. Why not just do it, Steinitz? Why didn't you play e5? I think you could do it. Oh, because now when you take with the knight, you're abandoning b6, perhaps? But even knight b6, rook moves, the only benefit there is that maybe a5 would hang after bishop d2, knight b6, if the rook leaves. So he's hoping to, 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 to pick up the a5 pawn and pushes a pawn. He's got some. He's got something to work with. Clean, clean pawn, and game insurance at least. So, so he starts with this. Really, really modest. Really modest by Zakator. So Starnet says, "All right, this time rather than going for e5, especially since you were really concentrating on b6, I'm going to try and counter you directly on the b6 square." Okay. We can see, though, that potentially Steinitz has committed a weakness on c6 and a5. As of now, 
This record's where its palm structure is more sound. It's got a solid pawn chain. These two are connected. As long as maybe maybe he'll just well the bishop stops rook b1, but if he needs to, he can maybe go bishop c3. But it's not really easily attackable at the moment. Uh, but potentially later on he wants to double up on b2. So well yeah, I mean actually he was threatening to take on a4 and then queen takes and then rook takes b2. So he just takes it. Queen c3. How is he gonna deal with b2 if you double? Well now he's just gonna take on a5. Yeah. If rook if doubles rook to take on a5, you pin the rook to the queen. So queen moves instead, getting off that potential pin and hitting b2. That's what it revolves around, plus b3. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Science was probably feeling okay, but again, he's got the a5 and c6 weaknesses. It really comes down to that pawn structure. So I think, I think the b6 move backfired. I think Steinitz should have just played e5 like he did last time. It was a good move. That's the way to handle this. When they play c5, you should play e5. He sort of dithered there and um, went against his own possibly intuition. Maybe he was trying to mix it up, but I think he should have just stuck with what worked the first game. But I think psychologically, after the blow in the last game, he was a bit off. Knight d7, bishop d1, c5. Well, he gets rid of the weak pawn, but now, now there's a few weaknesses on the queen side, but at least he gets rid of the pawn. This reminds me of the Fisher uh, Fisher Spassky got a game six when Bishop gets the pressure on the diagonal after the looseness on the queen side and the queen's gambit type structure. Um, so we see this mirroring. Hey, maybe uh, maybe Fisher had that move in mind from this game, even though he modeled off Steinitz perhaps. But hey, whoever wins can model off of C4. It seems okay. It seems okay. It, strategically, it seems like Steinitz is making progress. He's He's turned his weak pawn into a strong pawn, protected, He's, which is inhibiting the b2 pawn, allowing him to pressurize his opponent more there. The rook on e2 looks silly. The bishop is nice. Yeah, I, I think Steinitz is doing just fine. What, what, what went wrong? But the bishop on a4 is good. It's good right now. Don't take on d7. Doesn't he take maybe then a4? Just leave it on a4 for now. Queen c1. Knight f6 wants to go to e. Again, the knight on g3 turned out to not be that good. I don't know why he'd want to trade it off. But what does Steinitz do? Where is his play? You can't even triple. Well, you could triple, let him take, and then you take. That was probably an option. I kind of like that. No, no, but then you got to babysit this knight on d7. The bishop is keeping him occupied. Yeah, it's just tying him up. So he ends up he ends up transferring the bishop to c3 in lieu of the queen. Nice. Huh. You see that structure happen a lot, actually. So now it's gonna be white who says, oh, it's funny how it transitioned. So before it was white who played c5 and black played e5. Well now white played c5, c4 himself, the mirror image of that. And now white's preparing potentially to hit him with e4. Plus he's saying, hey, no, you're not gonna actually trade off that. Knight for my knight. You're not coming into e4 like you want. So he's wholly restricting his opponent. Um, the pawn stop. The bishop stops the pawn from going to a4. The diagonal is annoying. This bishop hits a5 where it's fixed in place. The rook will probably just go back to a1 and get back in the game again. It's not a big deal. This pawn can't push. But I don't know. It, it, it's an imbalanced position. This pawn does seem to give black a little wedge. But where does black's play come from? It's not easy to progress here. Where does white's play come from? F3, what does he want? I think it, there's a lot of pressure on e4, though, from black. It's not going to be easy. But if you can get it in, sure. Maybe even h4, h5 at some point. Well, you're not going to hang the knight. Maybe knight e2 is coming to f Four? Where does white progress? Let's find out. No, he plays f3, then he goes f4. Well, maybe uh, he almost had to, because because after queen b8, he's hitting g3. But, it, I mean, otherwise, you gotta go, oh, you could defend it, like queen e1. You could do queen e1. Maybe his play is gonna come from f5. But again, he's seeding e4. 
Now doesn't that come in? No, first the remember in the last game, or the song is one anyway, in the first game, he brought his um he brought his bishop in, he brought his rook in, and then he pushed his pawns. So maybe maybe he's anticipating getting his pieces in first. So bishop d3 hitting the rook, rook moves. H5. He's trying to develop some kind of initiative now. I think it's a very uh, unclear game. I'd say it's unclear. It, it's kind of a toss-up here. Both sides are vying for the initiative. Um, there's not like immediately attackable weaknesses on either side. I think that Steinitz actually has gained some ground by controlling the light squares here, gripped by, gripped by the d5 and c4 pawns. I don't know. I don't know who I bet on here. I kind of like Steinitz, but let's see what happens. So he locks it up. Now he's fixing. But notice that these two pawns on the sides are fixed. He can play g6 if he wants. Queen d8. Ah, that's that's a target too on h4. And also keep an eye on this. So the play is kind of revolving around both wings. He, he's forcing g6. Hitting h5 with two pieces. Almost forcing it. Now does this bishop happily sit on d3 for a while? I think Steins was probably feeling good here. What happened? It was a long game. It, we're only halfway through, a little more than halfway through. Okay. Queen d2. Rook b8. Queen f2. Bishop e7. Let's see, let's see. Queen f2. I, I think this is the point of the game where they're just maneuvering a bit. They're on move 27, I think. Oh, it was, it, if I recall, yeah, it was 30 moves in two hours, and then every 15 moves an additional hour. So, so in the end game, you'll have a little more time. Um, I prefer after 30 moves. Local club had that. I like it better 30 than 40, because you're more likely to hit 30 moves. A lot of games, you don't even hit 40 moves. And, and by that time, you're, you're already in. You know, by move 30, you're probably in extreme time pressure. I do like the 30-second increment, which obviously they didn't have with the um, analog clocks back then. I'm not, I probably didn't have delay, just standard. Standard, um, yeah, two-hour games for the first 30. So they're about to hit move 30. So they're probably both in some time pressure. They're both going to jockey for position and maneuver a bit. He's improving his bishop. Okay, now he makes a decision on move 29 to come with his knight. That, that, that was a, that's a big decision. Yeah, I mean... Now it's a smart choice. So Zuckertorg just says, all right, it's a closed position. Let's create the imbalance of bishop versus knight. Let's play against your bishop. Sure, your bishop is annoying on d3. It's, it's become a pretty active piece. But again, remember the knight on h4, what was it? g6, supported by h5. Was it really doing anything? No, not really. So you have to ask yourself, not just is it a good piece, but does it contribute to the position? Does it work with the rest of the pieces? Does it attack things? Here, now as long as you stay off of those squares, you're fine. There's no mating net in there. It's not like um, it's not like the famous Anderson game where he creates a mating net with the bishop on d6. Okay, bishop takes, pawn takes. Look at that. that it's kind of nice in a way. I do like his grip on the light on the light squares for Steinitz. And the bishop on c3 is temporarily bad. You might want to play d5 at some point and tear it open. Um but still, I'm, 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 I'm holding out hope for that knight, getting some activity. What's going to happen with the h4 pawn, though? Doesn't he just drop the pawn? I still feel like maybe Steinitz has something. So he's got he's to resort to this. So he just dropped a pawn. Yeah, Steinitz has got to be doing pretty well here. I mean, it may not be winning, but he's up a pawn. His bishop pair is not awful here. With the, again, it's a closed position, but that bishop, at least he got out. He's not sitting on d5, he's on d3. He's a lot happier there. But still, how does Steinitz break in? The only one who has a break, really, is Zuckertor with g4. You can anticipate an f6, e5, or g5 break, maybe. Yeah, you could do g5, too, but then you might weaken this. I'm anticipating bringing the rooks to the h file, so, he, so we can anticipate g5 putting pressure on h5, and then anticipate g4 and tear it open. Let's see if he does that. So queen d2. Okay, he's still hitting a5. Queen centralizes. Knight f2. I'm thinking king g2 is going to come. Now notice he's preparing g4. 
King G2, Rook H1. Okay, we think alike. Um, yeah, G4 is coming. Now, the, look again, the pieces are in, but they're ineffectual. They're feckless. King G7, okay, Rook A1, right? Yeah. Finally, let's get the Rook back in the game. Bishop D8, G4. Okay, yeah, that was really the only thing to do there. G4 takes, just take back. And now we're, we're you know, now suddenly White's looking good. So he lost his H bomb, but it became a, something to open the file with. Now this rook is sorely needed back home. I think he should be able to get there in time. I mean, you can move your bishop and your rook back. Comes this way. He trades off that awful bishop though. But he's hoping that he's gonna again. This is a bad piece, but it's glue. It's glue holding B2. We want to get rid of the glue. It's like the game. It's like the famous game. Uh, Capablanca against Trayball, I think 1929, where Capablanca and ultimately ends up trading off his great light square bishop for Trayball's bad dark or light square bishop, but it enables him to break through. So that's probably Steinitz's reasoning here. What? Oh, he's already got a check because the fork. Look at that. He can't take it because there's a knight of six fork. So, king f8. Now what? Just double? Check again? Hmm. What's his angle here? Check. Or maybe, oh, what's he going to do with that? If you take the rook, the queen just takes back. Does he want to just trade rooks and bring this second? I don't know. What's he, what's he have in mind? He's going to go back. Okay, he repeats the move once. Yeah, then he determines. Yeah, because I'm thinking, like, why do you... But why... Okay, the question is, why didn't he go to E7? If he had gone to E7, was there... Wait. No. Oh! Oh, wait, what? Take. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, it's to take... Really nice finesse. It's to take on A8, but not after Bishop takes C3, you have Rook A7 check. So if you check, if you check, if he comes here, he opens himself up to another check. So there's no in between. Bishop takes c3 because then black gets hit by the in between move rook a7, and then you recapture, and you're up a wait, you're up a rook. Yeah, you're up a rook. So that's why he has to go back. So basically, Steinitz was or Zakator was saying, hey, let, let, let's test him out. Um, maybe he wanted to gain a little time on the clock, move closer to the next. Well, the next time control will be at move uh, 45. Yeah, so it's coming up. So he, he gained some time, and then one, and he sees, hey, he's going to fall for him. He as well test him out. And then after this, he goes queen f2. Now the bishop tries to go back, stopping queen h4. Let's just double rooks. First knight e5, okay. Improving the structure. And now he's ensuring that g6, f6 never happens because g6 falls. King g8. Can we, can we finally just double? Thank you. Okay. That was just, that rook was just begging to finally get back in the game. Uh, beautiful position for white. So we got 3, 4, 5 against 3, 4, 5, 6, but it's irrelevant. You're down a pawn, but what is black's extra? Okay, black's extra pawn is theoretically the g6 pawn. You can make, make a pass pawn in the endgame with f6 and g5. But that pawn's not doing anything for him. It's maybe a target by the knight sacking. Um, and meanwhile, the king is under attack. I'm thinking that bishop on c3 might go to b4 at some point. If we can get outside the pawn chain, we can create some chaos. Okay, well, after 95, all oh, right, you got a focal point here. Now, why did we not take immediately? Was it inevitable? <clears throat> yeah, there was, well, if you, if, if you went rook a7, you can still take on g6 because the pin here. If you went rook here, how about that? Now maybe check up, check up. Bishop b4 perhaps. Bishop b4 threatening knight g4, almost mate. King uh, check, uh, queen h4 is looking bad. Um, lots of checks all around the place, all around. Um, 
So he tries this. He gives up that. Oh, well, it's actually a sacrifice because he's, he's, it looks like because he's enabling bishop takes. But now do we have queen h4? Yeah, because after you take, it looks like, oh, he just takes the rook. But somehow it doesn't work. Let's try to find out why. Try to take a moment, maybe pause. Try to think about why bishop takes e5 doesn't work. Queen h4, king takes, check, bishop just blocks, not queen h4, bishop takes. What if we just take back with the pawn? Oh, we just take back with the, with the, um, the f pawn and we guard the rook and then we're infiltrating the queen f6 or something next. Or just double up and try to step a mate in the corner. Yeah, so actually we just take back with the pawn. Nothing fancy, I don't think. So bishop takes. I don't think we need anything tricky. Just take back. And we create a wedge, uh, dividing the board in half. And there's no refuge here. The bishop is really seen to be out of play. And remember, our bishop would still go to b4, not to mention e1 to h4 in some lines. But this is going to be mate. Yeah, this is mate. We have queen f6 coming or rook doubles. Game over. Okay. Yeah, it's already over on the move. So after rook takes f7. Rook f8, what does he do to win? Did he do rook h8 check? Oh, he just takes. Takes and then queen h4. No, of course not rook h8 division. Um, takes, takes, queen h4, and then mate. So he just he just picked off the bishop for free, basically. And then, it took, and then g6 collapses. If you take queen h4 is going to... You're winning the rook or you're mating because the knight covers f7. Beautifully done. What if king f8? Oh, let me just check and the rook's coming next. Should be mate soon, yeah? Well, we can at least win the queen. But no, that's got to be mate. Oh, it's already mate. Is that? Yeah, g7. Um, so, beautifully done. Another Zakator win. Okay, I feel bad because we're trying to see how Steinitz wins and, and now we have all these Zakator wins. Okay, we got two more. Okay, I'm gonna flip through these quickly, really quickly now. We're gonna we're gonna start flipping. Unless it's like unless it's amazing, and we'll take a moment. But okay, so we'll, we'll see how Steinitz lost from the white side. Spanish game, Berlin defense, which is which is incredibly popular nowadays, the last decade, uh, and this was in the 1880s. Okay, timeless. Some things never change. Despite the computers and all, this should be five. Okay, so that 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 invites the Berlin. Takes and then we have to go to d6. Hits the bishop. You take. I thought he was gonna take on c6. Usually nowadays, I think they take on c6 first and then they take on e5. But he takes on e5. This, they're both both viable. Well, he's allowing. You, know, you can't really take on b5 with the with the knight because then you take c6 with the knight and you win the queen. So takes, queen takes, rook takes check, bishop b7, only move. Probably just, oh, well, now we, so yeah, it seems, a bit, it seems inferior. Yeah, he didn't win the game. I mean, it's solid for white, but I, I don't think he's really getting anything out of it. I mean, there's not even really a lead in development. All you did is you got your rook to e5, and maybe d4 is coming. But black is fine, yeah. I think black equalizes. Um... So yeah, I'm pretty sure in modern play they take on c6, d takes, knight takes e5, probably, no, there's some queen trade. Now what they do is they takes, they play d4 first, knight d6, takes, takes, then they go like d takes e5 and they trade queens, stuff like that. Stuff along those lines. Yeah, because the knight's on d6, takes. Knight moves to f5, queen takes d8. Yeah, that's modern play. Let's see well, why this doesn't work for white. I don't think it's bad, but it's just not ambitious for white here. He gets the center first. Gets kicked. He can play c4 at some point. He goes for c3. Well, obviously not now c4, because if he goes c4, rook takes rook, then he wins d4. Yeah, black is fine. He could have opted for d5 for Zakator. 
but he I, I think maybe he was trying to roll with his lead. And he, see, D5 is only hoping for like equality, but D6 is imbalancing things. It's modest, but it's by imbalancing things, you might have more winning chances. Not to mention, he just didn't want Bishop E5. That maybe that maybe I'm overthinking it. I think he just didn't want Bishop E5. But but imbalance is important here. And see now now that he didn't play uh, D5, the Bishop has scope. Knight h4. What's he trying to do? Are, are we going to get another knight in front of the king on the third? Are we going to get another knight, knight to knight three kind of situation? On this square or this square? That's funny. It keeps on happening. Okay, knight goes here. Maybe he's seeing g2 as a focal point already. If he can get his queen in there somehow. Bishop in here. I don't know. Something. No, he just does that thing again. He keeps on doing it now. He's like, he's just spiting it. He's just, just to spite Steinitz. Knight g6. So he's giving up the bishop pair, but I think it's not a big deal here. Semi-open position, but the knight seems promising. He doesn't opt for it. He actually invites him to take his bishop. And he doesn't go for it. He prefers to be on c5, hoping to take on e6. Of course, the bishop's not going to let him take goes all the way back to c8 but he'll kick him out and then he says knight where are you gonna go queen e3 it's superficial this is all superficial yeah Steinitz just doesn't quite have it here I'm, I'm really curious to see how Steinitz gains ground later on because something here is just not working for Steinitz he doesn't get anything here he may as well have taken the bishop I mean the knight's going to get kicked, and he's got nowhere good to go. He may as well have played, or even uh, bishop c2 after b6, the knight can go back to d3. I mean, something. Yeah, it's, a, it's not doing anything on d3. Now, if he wants to go to d3, he's got to go to c1. Check. It's ineffective. Bishop b7's coming. Yeah, he didn't do anything. And the knight just comes back. Gets to gets to a better place on e6. Queen f3. Again, sort of superficial. It's not achieving anything. And if, if he wants... No, he's covering everything. Zakatorx is rock solid on the king side. Uh, obviously, the bishop's bad on b7 for now. But I think after c5, it'll prove more productive. And at least be supporting the center. So rook d8. Queen f5. Okay, we just. Do we have to go back to f8? Yeah, obviously not g6 because the knight bishop hangs. Yeah, we just cover h7, fine. You gotta be, in this kind of position, you have to be patient. Okay, looks like he's getting a little ground. I think it's, it's, I think it's equal. I think it's about equal. But again, that knight on b3 needs to get the game. Knight g2 to f3, perhaps. Okay, he gets hit, he goes to h5. Goes to, gets hit again, goes to, yeah, he's totally warded off his attack. Any semblance of an attack. Completely crushed. Okay, still approximately equal. Nothing, no one's really, no one really has anything to boast about here. It's going to come down to who maneuvers better. I like the knight on e6. Now the bishop is the one that goes to g3 instead of a knight. I think the bishop is better suited on g3. You see that a lot in queen's pawn structures. F4 drops back. Or bishop g5 to h4 to g3. It's nice and tight there. Guards the king and hits c7. Hmm. Now he fianchettos the queen on b7. Funny. Funny situation, huh? What's he hoping for? I think he wants c5. Yeah, he just gets it in. And then... And by the way, I'm not, I'm not looking at the moves. I'm trying to kind of guess the move. You could try to. So I can only see up to like the first row of the moves. But trying to guess is fun. And it... it um. Because if I were in this scenario, I want to test myself. Um, so c5, but it, again, it's, it's mandatory. This is just, you need to get some play on the in the center. You need a break. If you if in doubt, if you don't know what to do, find a pawn break. Now he's going to get the hanging pawns, I think. Sort of, again, sort of. Traditional hanging pawns, you don't have the c pawn here. Or you might have a c, the c pawn will be on instead on e3. 
and then white would be able to attack below it. But it's basically a hanging pawn scenario. But here, yeah, you don't really have the weakness on c5. It could be attack only d5, which is not at all under attack. So suddenly, I think black gained the edge again. And notice that the knight and bishop, along with the pawn, created pressure on d4. And okay, he's not going to play c4 this time. He's keeping the tension. Maybe he learned. Given anyway, Stiles doesn't give him a chance. But notice that since there's pressure, though, he almost had the take. I think he could have gone bishop b5 to secure it. I might have tried that. I don't like taking, though. Black is suddenly just dominant. It reminds me of a Kasparov versus Karpov game. But Black just gets real dominant in the center. 95. Gotta know those classics, they're really important. C4. Interesting. Kappa Blanc can do that much with his hanging pawns. He push and then allows him to like anchor on D2 and stuff. But besides, he, he might even. No, I don't even think he's gonna push his second pawn because because this pawn is gonna lose the C4 pawn if he pushes by if he pushes. But notice that it gives him the C5 square for the knight. And now he's still hitting B2. B B2 becomes more of a target. And it's fixed. And yeah, it's very uncomfortable. So th yeah, theoretically it's a backward pawn on d5. But again, it's more about in reality, how are you restricting your opponent? It happens a lot in the Catalan. The Catalan c4, c4 to c5. Get a lot and cr crunch their c6 pawn. It's kind of similar to this position. Bishop b1. Okay, he just tucks the bishop back. It was a loose piece. Didn't need to be there. Improving his position, see where he has an eye. Maybe f5. Let's see what he does. I don't think f5, no. Bishop d7. He doesn't mind giving up the bishop for the knight, because the knight's far more better, far more active, far better here. Um, of course, if you don't take, he's going to hit you with a4 and activate the bishop. It's kind of similar to the previous game, with the other game with bishop on d2 hitting a5. Getting on the diagonal from the queen side. Oh, he actually goes back to e8 first. So he guards f7. Just a rock solid position here. It's really hard to crack. Again, d5, yeah, that's the only target really. This two on f7, but that's not really, I can't consider that a target. It's a potential target. But so long as the bishop's on e8, the queen's on b7, there's no way to attack it, really. Um, e, if you can somehow get e6, but no, it's not going to happen. The bishops are not effective here, really. Oh, wow. So we have a tactic already. Oh, not, yeah, not because of this way, but because of this way. Too many angles. Looking in. But somehow it doesn't work, huh? Is the, what, what's the, what's the counter? It's interesting, in the last game, Zagator lost a pawn also, but he went on to win. So is he just losing a pawn? Oh, it's a, it's a mate, if you take. Did he blunder that? I think he, maybe he's falling apart. He blundered. <laughs> he got excited. I was thinking, too. I looked at him like, wait, you can't take the rook. You can take the queen. Um, but you never made a loop for your king. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's psychological. It's a cycle. He was falling apart a bit here, and he, he just um, loses a piece. And now it's just technique. Three, six against five. Just a pawn up for the piece is nothing. There's no real compensation for the knight. He resigns. Okay, interesting. He just blinded. So he needs to get it together. Come on, Steinitz. We're counting on you here. Wait, was that the fourth game? Yeah, it was the fourth game. We've already seen that. That's purple. Okay, let's look at five. Another Slav. Zakator wins again. Okay, let's flip through the, the last. This this was really Zakator to raw. You know, let, let, let's give him credit. He he played really well in that in the, in those moments. Um, I think there was also this this in addition to the long term match psychological pressure, the momentum of the match. There was the psychological pressure of the fact in that game he started to take over the initiative with c five, and um, Steinitz was just frustrated. D four. So we've seen this before. Okay, I was thinking maybe he'll try bishop. Like nowadays you see bishop at four a lot or bishop g five. No, he does e three. He doesn't, want to, he doesn't really gambit the pawn. He's ready to take it back on c4. So he goes through. I've seen Rashevsky do this successfully. 
the Trojan, I think there's very, it's more of a, I think it's actually called a positional variation. Um, I think it's against the Slav, maybe against the Orthodox. I think it's against the Slav. But yeah, Ryshevsky has a beautiful game with this. So queen b3, hitting b7. White's just going to get a slight initiative. Although I like it better in these lines where you get bishop f4. I used to play that, you know, and you get a little edge. But let's see what he gets here. Just really trying to take advantage of the fact that the bishop came out, taking is often a way to exploit that. Sometimes people play queen b3 immediately. Other times you try to exploit the bishop by going knight f3 to h4. Or you hit him with g4 later on. There's a lot of ways to exploit the bishop on f5. It seems active, but it's not always that good. I've, I've beaten a lot of people that did bishop f5. Um, so I'm just going into an end game by taking with the knight and having the bishop here. Queen b3. He just goes back. This is probably a line, but I don't like it for black. Yeah, he just had a retreat. Now white's got three pieces out. He's up two tempi. Maybe he'll hit the queen. I don't know. Knight e5. Interesting. Well, since he's up, uh, he's up, um, you know, got more development. Wow, so Steinitz, I think Steinitz was really showing his psychological vulnerability early in the match. Maybe he was he had some nerves. I mean, there's a lot of lead up to the match. But wow. So he's just saying, let me just get some initiative. You want to take it? I'll take back. You want to let me take on c6? Well, then it's going to remind you of that other game. The last two games going, you were black, and the knight went to, the pawn went to c6. Even though you ended up getting to c4, it didn't help you. So he's trying to, I, I think part of psychological play in matches is you try and give your opponent positions that bring up bad memories. That's what I'm thinking anyway. Um, if you know they don't like that position. Or particularly psychological preparation will be, um, you know, just in general, if you if you know that they like open open positions, you try and close the position, things like that. Bishop e5. Um, so he's just he's just threatening it. Queen c7. Yeah, White's got a real nice initiative already. Bishop, I was thinking that Bishop two. Rook c1 is coming, creating more pressure on the c6 point. What if a6? I think if a6, you'll just chop it with a bishop and go rook c1. Okay, he'll, so now we have a kind of uh, stonewall attack set up. I was thinking in the other game, maybe they would have ventured into that. Um, I like white here. Yeah, I like white because there's a little more initiative. More development. Is he going to castle kingside or is he going to play for g4 and stuff? So he starts with rook c1. He's still he's still um, trying to enhance the pressure on c6. Now he he gets nervous about it. I think knight a4 or even knight e2. Now notice that you know generally speaking again you don't want your king in the center. First of all, it's a semi-closed position, not fully closed, but semi-closed. So you're not going to get to the king immediately. Secondly, is it's about the specific uh, position. So in this position, the pieces can't get to the king. You know, not just based on the general principle. But based on the specific considerations of this position, which is also important, of course. So takes, takes, 98, castles. Yeah, I, I'm just liking white here already. I think I think Steins is sort of falling apart. He needs a break. He needs a, he needs to take a break for a few days and come back in, in, in a new location. And I guess the first location, was it uh, St. Louis or New York, wasn't working out too well for him. So castles, yeah. I mean, look at this. You got the F file. You got more space. You get the F file. You've taken away F6 from the knight. You got this wedge, this wedge that creates kingside attacking chances, particularly because the knight moved. You got, you know, and you can't defend H7. You've got um, the bishop pair, which even though it's a close, semi-closed position, the bishop can reroute. You can go to H4, or you play E4, busted open at some point, or you just give it up at some point, or you go to B4. There's so many options. Yeah, I mean, it's all white here. It's all white's game. Now he weakens himself. Well, you can argue white is weak as well, but white's more developed. This should favor the side with more development with two bishops. Okay, interesting. So I feel like there might even be a sack on d5 at some point. It's just that the position's right. Yeah, he was worried about that. If if e takes, knight takes, if pawn takes, queen takes, check, and then you win the rook. If rook takes, rook takes, 
Yeah, it actually wins. So look at this. If he takes, knight takes, it doesn't matter if you take or not. Takes, queen takes check, game over. Because the bishop can't block, the queen can't block as the rook king moves, rook down and game. So, uh, yeah, it's the second he plays f6, it's already almost losing. I mean, not losing, but it creates tactical possibilities that are very ugly. So, after rook, so rook f7 is intended to um, obstruct the diagonal from tactics. Um, now he might really be threatening this, but then, but then, um, Zuckerberg counters with this hitting h7. He's just rolling with the momentum he's getting here in the game and in the matchup overall. So Steinitz plays for f5. Now notice what Steinitz's worst piece. We call it the, the, the bad French bishop, that bishop on c8. Of course, the rook is bad too because the car needs to get out of the garage to let the other car out of the garage. Um, yeah, it's already bad. Um, I'm seeing g4 stuff. I like g4 cracking it open. Should come soon. Maybe knight to c5, knight a4 to c5, because you can't go b6. This bishop needs to reroute. Maybe bishop e1 to h4. Maybe bishop to b4 at some point. But I'm anticipating g4 and those other things. Ah, knight, yeah, he goes knight to f4. That's that's attractive for the knight. Maybe knight g3 to h5. But I think f4 is more, yeah, it's stronger on f4 because he hits e6 too. And not to mention that g5 point. Even though these pawns are on light squares, they can become targets themselves. And obviously he's weak on the dark squares, where white is strong. Are we doubling? Doubling and then g4 becomes stronger because it's pinned and you take f7. Okay, so he uses, again, that bishop becomes useful on c3. It's a bad bishop. But, it, but you know, a lot of people like in modern times, people like to go bishop g5, bishop f4. But he proves that you can have, yeah, it's not going to be as active. But sometimes you almost want that bad, temporarily bad bishop to kind of glue your position together. And of course, that's why in the previous game, Steinitz flirted with taking it after bishop a5 takes c3 ideas. Gets away from the file. Transitions toward the king's side. Well, now we have bishop moves later on. Devils, g4 is threatened, or at least anticipated. Ah, good move. He trades off his bad bishop. Should we keep the bishop though? Or should we keep the knight? That's a tough choice. I like knight f4. No, he chose that. I like knight f4 because you're hitting e6, but but he's anticipating probably g4 cracking this stuff open. Well, maybe the g file becomes more relevant. Let's see. But he keeps the bishop here. Well, yeah, I mean, even though it's a semi-closed -clo position now, not not like sealed, but it's almost it's, it's a closed center, so it's a closed position. Um so we're going to play on the flanks with the closed position. But the bishop can come out. And, and we, we can activate our bishop soon. Okay, he's hoping for some activity in, on his newfound di di diagonal with that bishop. Yeah, g4 is there. He's ready. He wanted that. He did it like last game too. Remember, we, he did g4, but it was for different reasons. Um, it, it, it was to hit h5, I think. And this time, this time he hits f5. I think so, if I recall. It may have, been, it may have hit f5. I think it was h5. Okay, so after g, so g6 is expected. That's going to seal, trying to seal this, or trying to at least overprotect the weakness. Do we take it or do we wait? I, I, I think we might have h4, h5 stuff. King g2, similarly, we can attack on the h4 if we want. No, he just goes h3. He holds, he hangs tight. Defense the pawn. What's his idea? Oh, maybe rook h2, keeping his king there. King g2, why wouldn't you want king g2? Because king g2 allowed the rook to move getting off this. Ah, but the second you give up that pressure on the on the file, then you, you allow him to take since you, yeah, since you don't have the pin anymore. So he's, he's patient with it. Rook c7, well, he wants to defend his rook. Guard on the second rank. Second rank. Okay, he gets off it. He wants to move his knight probably to g3 or h4. Or f4, sorry. He's really overprotecting that square. 
I have, I have five. Okay, he goes to f4, hitting uh, d5 and e6 and g6. That may help with the h4, h5 push. I, I, I would like to achieve h4, h5 if it's, if it's uh, easy to do. Maybe even g5 and then h4, h5 and just double up. That might be possible. Now that he's sealed his knight there, he goes g5 and just keeps it there. No, he goes for the capture, though. But keep that in mind. It's interesting. But I, but I think it, only the H file would be enough to win. So he wants to open up more lines. So now he's got the G file to work with. Now we move our king, yeah? Or just move the rook in front. And then maybe double rooks after move the king. So now he's got knight H5 to F6 ideas. Knight H5 immediately. So he doesn't allow it. Okay, the king looks pretty snug on H2. Doubling rooks is coming. So we're going to, for now, we'll get the G file. Especially because if the knight moves, allowing rook g7, we have knight h5. If the knight comes back, we have knight f6. Then we're hitting g8. So we have a lot of infiltration. And notice they're bad bishops, theoretically. But this bishop goes to b4 again. This bishop hits f5, which might be tactically relevant later on. If we ever sack on e6, we can take on f5. Plus you have bishop c2, and you can move along the, that diagonal to d1, h5, or something. Double rooks. Okay, we're shifting over, queen h4. Now we're anticipating maybe queen h4, knight g6 at some point, perhaps. Oh, wow, we already have. So so he's already um, queen e8. He blew up this again. Wow. He was not playing like a world champion yet. Took a little time. So queen e8 allows the take because no, now notice that the queen before was on c6 guarding e6. Second, it goes to e8. You, you, you just take and you fork. And not only that, but you 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 know you get your pawn back, but you you collapse the position. And interestingly, once you collapse these pawns, then we got the pawns pushing, and the bishop will breathe fire down the diagonal, made it basically made him the king. Um, so he just he just threw it. He says, "All right, I'm I'm just done." This was in New York, yeah. He's like, "I'm just done with this on uh, New York. This is not working out for me. Let's move on to let's see a win now. Now we got where was he next?" So game six, now he was in, okay, St. Louis. Well, interestingly, that's that's now where the St. Louis Chess Club is, where Sinkfield get, you know, threw all the money um, into chess, bringing all Pete, bringing Caruana there and all that, and all the, you know, UF championships. So we had a world championship match there, historic, in the first one, officially, in 86. Interesting. Okay. I'm not sure if that's tied, if that was... Well, I think I think Sinkfield is just from St. Louis, so he wanted to. He was like, "Hey, why not make St. Louis a chess mecca, right in the middle of the heartland?" I actually, did some work in a military, a military base um, uh, near there, Fort Leonard Wood, which is a couple hours from St. Louis. St. Louis is beautiful. Yeah, the Central West End, right there, by the, the chess club. It's cool. You should try. To, if you haven't made it, try to stop by. Um, okay, so does he change his approach? He played e4. I think. He, yeah, I think Stein has been playing e4 and Zucker Torsten been playing d4. I think every game. Okay, let's see. How does he come back? Well, he clearly he 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 figured out whatever was going wrong. He just I feel like he was just kind of playing planlessly, and now he figured something out. Let's see the role now. Let's see Stein's role. Let's see him him fit the mold of a world champion now. Okay, so classical Roy Lopez Spanish game. Now again, he wants to say, "Hey, it worked last time. Let's play the Berlin again." But see if he. I, I doubt he's going to go into the same line. He does. See, nowadays I'm pretty sure they take here. Again, I'm not an expert in these lines, but I've seen it so many times from watching the top level games. You just take on c6. I guess it wasn't established theory back then. Rook takes. Bishop e7. So I think in the last game he did d4. Now he deviates with knight c3. Novelty. Is it a novelty? Maybe. Um, knight c3. Novelty of this matching. Um, but back then it was so right to, you know, to explore. So of course Stein has contributed a lot to these theories. Um, knight to the theory. So knight c3, not just to, to general chess theory, but I'm sure to opening theory as well. Castles. Hmm. How does he continue to improve? Does he play d4? No. He plays a very odd move. <laughs> so it's like, okay, you block your deep arm with your knight. I'm going to block the deep arm with my bishop. But uh, he must have done some, some deep preparation here. 
It almost looks like a Marshall Gambit when when uh when black for for black though reversed where he gets the rook out and I think the bishop starts aiming there tries to provoke g6 but again reversed. And then he's looking now. Oh, so he's exploiting the fact that since the pawn can't move, he can go rook h3 if he wants. Let's see if he does that. He's playing almost like he's almost like a bird opening with bishop d3 and bishop b2. But does he transition with f4? Let's find out. He just sticks all his pieces on the third rank. He's playing actively. He he makes no effort to take any center yet. Just piece play. Very interesting. It works apparently. Bishop transitions. Does he take it and go bishop b2? I would just take it. Keep the initiative going, yeah. So now, now 94 is nice. Take the diagonal. Yeah. No more bishop f6 possibility. Yeah, now white's probably better. And look at the weaknesses on the dark squares. So, okay, he finally got a good opening. Bishop b7. Yeah, I think, I think Steins was running into trouble in the opening and then and then he wasn't getting much out of it, and then he was just kind of falling apart later in the game. Probably out of frustration. Okay, so queen e3. Got to keep it together. Mental toughness. Mental toughness. It's very important in chess, competitive chess. Queen e3. D5. I learned that in wrestling. I never forgot it. This stuff sticks with you. Pin club. <laughs> pin club's not fun. You get, someone gets pinned, everyone's got to do pin club, and you get tough from that. It develops your stamina and mental toughness. So queen d4. F6. Yeah, he's already he's already forced um compromise. So F6 is a compromise. It's weakened similar to I think it was game two where he had F3 play. So you see there's a lot of similarities across the games. <laughs> Speaking of which, knight G3 again, again. They really like their knights on G3 or bishops. Okay, bishop b6. Now notice that since f6 was played, this is undefended. So immediately we're seeing weaknesses here. The rook, of course, will come in. Hit that, yeah. Bishop f7. Knight g7. Reasonable enough. Fion I think Anand did that. Talked about Fion Kedong is not on g7. It looks like the queen Fion Kedong on b7. Um, but we guard e6. Z and now we're playing a Steinitz. Zuckertort, who's now going to lose guards in this. Because now, now we're going to see the star come out. There we go. Look at this. He's got a beautiful position now. Great attacking position. Bishop and queen against battery looking here. Tying him up. Other bishop here. Weaknesses on the king side. Pressure here. Knights looking in here. Pawns coming. Once you do the pawn h5, once you get pawn h5, you're really softening him up. He's got to soften him, loosen up his position a bit. Kind of probing here and there, and then bam, we're gonna break in. So um, yeah, just kind of just little little preparation, preconditions, creating the preconditions for attack, as as Vukovic talks about in art of art of attack in chess. And I would recommend art of defense as well by Solter. Um, yeah, just a great position. So he's got to be happy inside here after playing h4. Just a really nice advantage for White here. We in development to everything. He's got everything he wants. Now we're just looking for tactics. We're looking to crash in. But it's very important. You got to create those preconditions. Your tactics don't come out of nowhere. They come from a superior position. Queen, generally speaking, queen d7. Unless you just get lucky with a scramble. Queen d7. Defending. Covering the dark, the white squares. Preparing to bring out the rook. H5 hitting g6. Opening up the h file, potentially h. I don't think he wants h6. I think he wants g6, obviously. He's provoking g5. If you play g5, you hit him with h6. g5, h6. Now we got, now we got weak light squares and dark squares to work with. Plus you got knight h5 following. You can't even go knight f5 after h, g5, h4. If you go like this, you can't even go knight f5 because e7 hangs. Takes, 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 and that's a game. It's game. Rook takes, and then you crash it on. You crash it on the dark squares. Um, so we got h6. No, no, not h6. What do you do? That's a sideline. So after h5, he just takes. So again, we're softening. Ooh, I don't like that. Now we have a lot. Look at this. We got a, we got a loading pawn on f6. We got, 
lack, a little bit of a lack of protection on y squares. If the pawn had come in, the pawn itself would have been subject to attack, but at least it would cover it h5 and f5. But also the h file would rip open. Maybe you don't maneuver the knight to f4, g3, king g2, rook h1. A lot of options in. Uh, bishop takes g6, queen e3 hitting a simple attack on the bishop, but we've also now we got queen h6 coming. Maybe, oh, of course, bishop takes pawn takes. It's like a weak fiong keto position, and the queen gets an h6. Do we, oh, okay, that seems like a reasonable defense. Do we ever have f4, f5? Queen f4. What does he want? He's offering, see, if the bishop ever takes, because this bishop we call um, Soltis in Art of Defense in Chess, he calls that repairing weakness. There's similar examples with the bishop on, again, g6. When you, have, when you lose your g pawn, the bishop goes to g6, covers weakness, um, acts as a pawn. If the bishop takes on d3, yeah, who cares? You double the pawns, who cares about that? You're weakening f5 and h5. Everything becomes lethally weak on the king side. So you just can't even fathom taking on d3. Rook comes in the game finally. Okay, Rook lit. Super active. Again, process of maximizing the pieces. 96, Queen G4. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at the geometry. Hitting this way, hitting this way, pinning the knight to the queen. Well, you have to go to F8 to get out. Very uncomfortable. Tied up. Plus, we're hitting F5. We're still at this. We can go Bishop F5 now. Strengthening it. The bishop takes, knight comes in. Knight comes in immediately. Well, of course, he's offering the bishop to take. The bishop takes, covering all the light squares with the bishop there. Beautiful. Basically, strategically winning. Sorry, I mean, it already is strategically winning, even if he doesn't take. He goes bishop c5, hits the rook. We have tactics. Check. Check again. What are we on? Move 29. There you go. When you see move 28, 29, you see repeating moves. They're gaining time on the clock. Nothing wrong with that. Because now, now he goes again, then he could think he could think more. If he needs to, he can go back once, I think. Yeah, he can go back once, but he can't repeat again, otherwise it's going to be a draw. Wait, what? How many times has it been? If it's... Okay, this was the position now. That's on a five. So that's the first position. One. Two. Three. Oh, they must have, yeah, obviously it's been a three-fold repetition. I'm pretty sure three-fold repetition rule was around back then, uh, but maybe they got the notation wrong. It's possible, too. Maybe, they, I don't know what it was, but that's weird. Okay, then he takes. So he just repeats a bunch of times, apparently. I think it's notation. Okay, queen takes g4. Okay, let's watch him win the endgame. Wait, is he winning? Is he just winning something? So he takes a bishop. He takes a queen. Doesn't he just drop the rook? No, 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 no. Sorry. He takes the rook first. And then, wait, why wouldn't he repair the weakness by bringing the pawn to g6? Oh, he's, he's dropping f6. So he didn't want to drop it with check, that's why. So he doesn't win a piece, but he gets a pawn at the end of the line. He gets a pawn in a really nice game. So basically, he, um, Steinitz gets a nice endgame. Okay, let's look at some endgame technique. This is really important. Never underestimate endgame technique. It's super important. I mean, you could win like a third or a half of your games just by playing good endgame. Okay, so I think it matters. Um, and, and to not be afraid of going into endgames when you have the endgame skill, partially by studying games like this. So notice what he does first. He just strengthens his pawns, gets away from the bishop. Past pawn is going to be this one, pushing. Let's restrict the knight. Make sure your pieces, make sure your opponent's pieces are restricted. You can't go anywhere real good. The king starts to come and maximize your king in the end game immediately. H5. That becomes a target, perhaps. Oh, he just trades it. Hmm. Maybe that helps him infiltrate too. But he's just playing, he says, hey, I got five against four, zero risk. Oh, and he, I think he thinks, because you usually don't want to trade pawns if you're winning, if you're up. Um, you want to trade pieces, not pawns, because more trade, more, the more you trade pawns, the closer you get to a draw, because you could be up, you could be up a knight, um, but no pawns left is a draw. You could be up a pawn, but you get a theoretical 
some sometimes it's a theoretical uh, king of pawn draw. Um, but I think he probably thought his opponent would try to push. Now it's really a target on h4, I think. Trying to, you know, at least make something with h4 pawns. He's probably going to win. If he goes out f4 and gets the, if he takes, he gets two connected pass pawns. So he doesn't allow that. King f3, yeah? Oh, oh wait, what's going, what's going on? Pawns coming. Do we need to go king f3? Oh, of oh, yeah, yeah. You just want to stop the pawn. So simply going to h3. That's that's the way to go. Yeah, king f3, h3 is a bit risky. Because you go knight f4, he just takes, takes. He goes h2, you go back, he takes on f4. We don't need that. No, then, then he holds on h2. Um, so king g2, king h3. Oh, he just wins it then, huh? Yeah, he gets the pawn. So I think... Yeah, that was a mistake by Zuckerberg. Not the best defender. They weren't the best defenders back then. They weren't known for that. They were known more for as being attackers. I think Zuckerberg was an attacking, known as an attacking player, as you can see. Um, Steinitz is probably a little more balanced and, again, a so-called scientific player. Trying to create uh, principles that could be applied across the game. G4. H4. Hmm. Yeah, he should have taken it. Just take it and try and draw. But now he picks off another pawn and gets a pass pawn. I mean, this. Oh, okay. Can't we still just take and go king h3? Yeah, there's no getting in. And it's nice because you have all your pawns except for e3 on light squares. So the bishop's not going to win anything. And the knight will beat the bishop with two extra pawns. I think. Are we going to get there? I think we're going, we're threatening g7 to f5. So we stop, we corrals the knight. So it's not easy here. How does Steins do it? Knight f5, of course. Knight f4. Yeah, knight f4 because you you, you just, you're, you're going to go to g2 anyway. And you're inviting, actually you're hitting d5. So you, you, you're forcing his hand and you're threatening check and take. So you're forcing his hand, but if he takes, then you have a winning king upon endgame because takes, takes. I'll show you here. If he goes here, <coughs> excuse me. If he <coughs> takes on f4, takes king, takes king, takes h4. Why wouldn't it let me show that? Okay, well, you see it. Bishop takes pawn, takes king, takes king, takes h4. So now he's trying to undermine the pawn that holds the knight, but he gets the check. Check. Oh wait, this is a little risky still. Maybe he lets you. He lets him take on e3. But he covers it, and then he gets h4 too. Let's see. Does he take c5? Oh, no, no, no. He takes, that's a smart move. He takes on d4. So, yeah, I don't think he, you don't want to let him take on d3 if you don't have to. I was scared. So, you take on d4, hitting the bishop. So, if he takes the knight, you just take back. And again, you're going to have the winning a. G pawn will, will be your decoy. You take on h4, use your g pawn as a decoy. And then you rush your king over to the queen side while the black king is occupied over on the king side. So, you take. And now you have a fixed, that's an asset there, just having the pawn sitting on d4 is an asset for white. And now he's, of course, he's got a beautiful square on e4, where he gets there with tempo attacking the pawn, and then on b7, and then he has a check. Now, if, if, he, gets to, if he gets to check on e4, though, then he takes on h4. Oh, he's getting there anyway. Ah, he's hoping to get into f4. He's hoping to infiltrate. But I, I guess Steinitz has weighed this out. There's not enough pawns to really create too much chaos. And, yeah, he's hoping it's going to become like a race with the king against some pawns because of course we can win the we can win the bishop by just using our king and pawn and kid put rushing on the king side he's hoping to get c2 and stuff in d3 but by then maybe the knight can sack it's still going to be a bit of a race how can we have, we can't really avoid the race maybe we can bring our knight back and guard the pawn but the thing is to guard the light squared pawns you got to be on dark squares at which point it'll be kicked off by the bishop i think he's going to no, but the, but the bishop can't do much because he's got to babysit the pawn on the king side. So, ah, okay, so he slows him down a bit. He Oh, nice, nice. He gets to c4, so he's not getting in to e3. If you go e3, I check and take the bishop immediately, game over. So he has to move his bishop back. Now we go c4. No, he goes c6. So he's playing more. That, that, that seems to be a good thing, yeah. Rather than overly becoming overly passive and defending, he, he stays on offense. That's a good policy. Actually, he's winning the A pawn, right? If A5, you fix it with A4, then you go knight B8 and take it. Now, he brings his bishop back, but 
but you're then, but then you can you can uh, use your G pawn to decoy the bishop if you need to. So the king comes in, he gives him the A pawn. It's just too many pawns, yeah. He's gonna get, you can get the C pawn, but it's too late now. Knight knight what knight back, and then the A pawn's rushing fast. First do we play D four? I think the A pawn just rushes because the knight the knight is actually corralling the bishop here. Stopping any bishop move. Notice the d4 pawns in his way as well. And now the a pawn is rushing and it's game. It's got to be game. Throws in a check. Ah, stopping king c3 because the knight check and knight takes and the knight gets back in time to sack for the pawn. And then you win with the past pawns. So you're just probably preparing. Do we sack for the pawn? a5? Yeah. Hit the bit. Well, you can't actually win the bishop really because you gotta worry about that pawn. I think we kind of want to sack. Oh, we get knight d5, and if he pushes, we can sack by going knight f4 check. So again, but with a temp. So he goes here, stopping knight f4 and stopping knight d4. But by this point, we got our own pawn rushing, and if he ever goes um, d3, we have knight c3 covering d1. Oh, he determined that he can take it. So he takes, pawn pushes. What does he have now? Does, is it, it, oh, it's just like a, is it just a rape? No, he's gotta use something. He's gotta use his knight somehow. Oh, he just goes knight, yeah. He goes knight back and knight c3 and his opponent can resign. Yeah, of course. So he had to be real patient with the knight. But remember that he, it's, it's interesting how he played actively there. Knight, I wonder about knight c4. Let's see what the computer thinks is the best move. Curious. Just to do a quick engine analysis on that move. Does it like knight? Does it like the active knight c6? Because we're basically winning a7. But you just have to determine that your offense is strong enough. Yeah, it says plus point plus six. Like more than a rook up. Knight c6, a6. Knight d4, a king e5. Knight takes a6, king d5. Yeah, I mean, just too many pawns. Too many pawns. Really well played ending. That was nice. All right, let's do some more. I, I, can we do the whole, we can do a whole marathon. Maybe I'll do two parts. I may have to set up the two parts. Um, let's see. What game are we on right now? It's it's 20 games. Right now we're on game seven. Okay, let's let's watch Stein and Swim with Black. Let's just keep going. Oh, then then he then he well, he has a two-game streak, then they draw. Let's let's maybe I'll stop after this one. And then we'll pause it. But there's there's a lot of good stuff here. Um in these games. Lots of nuggets of wisdom. So settings. Invert board. Zuckertort versus Steinitz. Okay, let's watch Steinitz win the black. Tarash defense. I think it's called, I think it's pronounced Tarash. Who was one of the strongest players in the early 1900s? Um, and well, I guess he invented, it probably wasn't invented by him at this time already. And this is named after him. I imagine late 1800s, early 1900s. So we have D4, D5. So the idea is that you play C5 quickly. Well, he goes C4. Then we probably go E6, yeah. And then c5 is coming. So we have we start with an orthodox. Orthodox queen's gambit declines. Well, it's only orthodox if you play like bishop e7, knight bd7. And you can you can be flexible with that. But now we have a tarash. So both sides have played c4 and c5. Um, usually you end up with an isolated queen's pawn. This pawn ends up on its own. And you just kind of take it on as black, but you get active play. So generally that happens after white takes on d5. I, personally, I like playing with white with the bishop on g2 against it. Um, and then really just pounding away at the pawn on d5. Um, and tend to get, I tend to get good positions with that. Knight f3, knight c6, a3. Now it becomes essentially it transposes into a queen's gambit accepted, really. Which I like. It's a very fluid opening for black. So generally after takes, uh, people like to play a6 a lot in those lines. But he takes, oh, so it turns out that black is the one who initiates the exchanges and says, hey, I'm gonna saddle you with an isolated queen pawn, which which has its pros and its cons. I had, I, I did a blog one time, interesting, if you look at my blog, um, David Bennett chess blog, El Tenedor, the fork in Spanish, there's um, there's a game by um, Morphe actually, it's really interesting, because what I, what I was saying was isolated queen pawn Think of it as oh you, you get the isolated queen pawn you have that dynamic 
in the dynamic compensation for the structural weakness, and often the person with the high static weak point attacks. But in this case, Morphe is playing black against it. Uh, who was he playing? I forget. Um, but he just attacks really hard against the isolated green bond. He gets all his tactics against it. So it's a really great game to look at. Um, yeah, it says how Morphe, how Morphe defeated the isolated green bond or something. Okay, bishop takes c4, c takes d4. I always like when you find those types of gems you come across. Like, I got I to gotta share this. Um, especially even like the Steinus games. Like the Fisher said, they're so important. But Steinus games aren't always appreciated or, or looked at by a lot of, especially nowadays, they just study with, I, I, my, my hunch is that a lot of, Younger players, they have the computer, they study with that, they probably play a lot of Blitz. I'm sure they study some classics, especially if they have good coaches that, that say, hey, you've got to study the classics. Um, but I imagine a lot of people don't do it now, of all ages. End games, too. It's another thing. It's like, oh, I don't want to study the end games, but hey, you got to know it. Um, e takes d4. I like studying from practical end games, from actual games. See how they arrive at it, like Capablanca's end games. By, um, the book by Chernev is very nice. Okay, e takes, you gotta know your theoretical ones too. Bishop e7. So it's just playing solidly. Castles, castles. Bishop e3. Okay, this is a standard setup. So why does White's taking note, you know, of the weakness on um, e d4? Maybe now it allows him to move his knight to e5. Typical idea with the isolated queen pawn is you have pressure on the e file and the c file. You get um, you get a little more space. You control e5 and c5, maybe the knight goes to c5 in that one. And a lot of times you end up getting a battery on this diagonal. Like you do queen d3, bishop, rook c1, bishop b1 to, or b3, and gets here, and you make a battery combined with perhaps uh, bishop g5 or knight e4 or knight g5 to e4, something like that. Some way to undermine this knight and then try to mate or provoke g6 and then go back to b3 and sack on e6. That's the typical uh, method for that. Or you try and play d5 and bust it open. Those are the main plans for White sometimes maybe f4 or f5 that's a bit weakening. Okay, so after bishop d7, you got queen d3, rook c8, hitting uh, hitting a little bit a little bit of pressure there. But notice uh, a3 here. Notice a3 for Zakator is a good move because anytime you set up any battery here, you're not going to get hit with knight b4 because a lot of times you want Black's plan is to usually blockade the pawn. Ideally, you want to shift this knight from the, sh the knight wants to shift to here. So if you could gain a tempo and hit the queen, that's really useful because then you come here next um, and just make sure the pawn stays in place and this knight supports this knight and so on. Um, and then usually white wants to keep the minor pieces to attack. Black wants to trade them off to kill white's attacking chances. And then black wants to get the heavy pieces, the heavy artillery piled up on here, get them behind it, and then crack them with e5 and win the pawn because of the pin. That's the that's thematic plan, the isolated queen pawn. Uh, rook c8, rook c1, queen a5. Interesting. I don't know. It's active. I mean, you want rook fg8. Why not? You can also switch. It's like I mentioned. You don't. You don't have to be passive. You can play active with queen h5. So suddenly she improves from d8 to h5, and maybe you're the one who sets up a mating attack. Um, but I, it does just white's more justified usually. In setting up the mating attack with the isolated queen pawn, generally. So bishop a2, but those are rules of thumb, they could be broken, depending on the specific circumstances of the position. So rook fd8, we're x-raying that pawn already on the queen. Maybe bishop to e8, just tuck it in and get some nice pressure on d4, maybe e5. Okay, does it? Now we can we can uh, contemplate the blockade also with knight d5. Possibly doubling rooks. I mean, I like e5 if we can get away with it. I think yeah, I have a hunch he'll go knight d5. Maybe bishop f8 and then knight e7 e5. I don't know. Let's see. Okay, so so he doesn't even wait to be, for the knight to be attacked and to undermine h7. He just says, all right, no, <laughs> I'm going to block that. That's not going to happen. So that, like I mentioned, a lot of times after they play g6, they weaken the, they create this complex that could be attacked, and they weaken the dark, the dark squares too. So you really want to tear it open. Then you play for d5. So you try and go bishop a2, and then go d5. Maybe it's a sacrifice even. You give them that pawn, but you open up the e file, you weaken f5 more, things like that. Queen e2, bishop f8. I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I like it when the pieces go back, 
You get like the long range pieces that go to the back rank, but, but you could see they're still effective. And the bishop actually reroutes if it wants to g7. At least it covers, at least it covers the dark square, stops this. If bishop g5, yeah, that's when. No, actually, at bishop g5, we have tactics with knight takes d4. Because it because then we take on, if he takes, we take g5. So that queen on uh, a5 is useful. So we got bishop of 8, rook, rook e d1. We got red 1. Or, or in uh, old parlance, it would be the, um, the back then they would say king rook to queen 1. I've, I've learned from some old books like that. King rook to queen 1. The nice thing is you don't have to rely on the grid, and it's the same for both sides. Whereas now it's it, it, the preference is from the white side, but but before it was it was it was neutral. Um, pros and cons. So rook to d1, bishop g7, bishop a2. Okay, so he's maybe anticipating. Uh, you see, everyone's just getting their pieces centralized, and both are kind of anticipating some sort of break in the middle. Um, and ideally, Steinitz would like to blockade the d4 pawn. So bishop a2, knight to e7. So yeah, that's what happened. The knight went to go to d5. Actually, I think he might want f5. But if he can get a nice, solid blockade on d5, he won't turn that down. Notice that, yeah, the pawn can't really go to b4 because you drop a3 and you weaken c3. Queen d2, queen a6. Hmm, are there some tactical? There might be some tactics with knight to d, yeah, knight d5 hitting the queen, and then you throw in the check. King f8, throw in another check, desperado, you can lose a knight, takes back, and then he recoups the queen on d2. Yeah, so knight d5 was a threat, so he goes queen a6. So that's a pretty good value. A queen's a bit out of play. White hasn't really established it much. He hasn't really gone for a big attack. He's kind of, I think, he's a bit devastated maybe from the turn of events from the last game. Now Zuckertort is playing a bit more cautiously. Okay, he gets the bishop in. But I am, no, Zuckertort's playing fine though. He's doing fine. Okay, so he chose that fine. Well, that, that, that's really when you're going more to win the pawn. As opposed to just blocking. So you're letting him push, but it's not so palatable. I mean, you're gonna open this, you're opening up the D file against the queen. What? I don't know about that. Seems loose. See, I feel like he's he's been so patient, and then he's like, alright, I'm just gonna lash out. That's a lashing out move. It's not sophisticated, it's 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 weakening. I mean, if if it helps your position, yeah, but you weaken f3, the knights lose. And the knights lose, the knights protecting the pawn. Well, you can even sack the exchange potentially, just take it. I don't think so. But yeah, the looseness just allows the tactics already. So knight takes. If knight takes, then. Why are we not losing a piece? What's, what's this justification? Hmm. Do we have 94 or something? Rook takes, queen takes. Knight takes. Just e5. Yeah, just pawn e5. And notice the bishop on e8 is really well placed because it guards f7. So when you play e5, you no tricks on f7. Yep. And we get the knight back. Probably with interest. Get some interest on that investment of a knight. Very short term investment. This guy's day trading. He's just day trading. In this case, it works. Usually, it doesn't, I don't think. But knight d5. Rook takes c1. Hmm. He's just trading down, okay. Well, now that now the rook won't be a liability on c8. I think we, yeah, we're gonna get something on D. Stuff is falling on the D file. Takes, what do we take? Just take back the knight on D4, yeah? And now we got three, six against five. But look at that gaping, look at those gaping wounds around the white king. 
It's terrible. Terrible position. Got bishop c6 is in the works. It's coming. Yeah, this is... I would not want to be white here in this position. I would not want the white pieces. Um, only benefit is the pin. That's, that's nothing. Notice the queen actually came in handy. She's guarding this. And there's pressure here. We're threatening to take potentially with the rook on d5 and get two pieces for the rook. So he takes with this one. Guarding. We well, gets his pawn back, but the looseness. This actually reminds me of a game from like, I think it was the California High School Championship back when I was in, um, yeah, I lived in California growing up. And I did G4 and I learned my lesson. It's just like the position just opened up and he exploited it really nicely just by playing tight and looking for his opportunity to get in. I'm sure that's what Steinitz will do here. He's going to get in. He's just trading. Oh, wait, he's giving up the rook, it looks like. No, he's not because he's hitting the rook. He's hitting the rook himself. So does the rook take back on d5? He has to, otherwise it's dropping. If the bishop, no, the bishop takes on d8, we take on d4, he takes on d5. Do we even have maybe queen d6? Just the position is so open. So again, even though we're trading pieces, the attack is still possible for black here. Just the, I mean, all you need is uh, two pieces. You got a knight and a queen, knight and a rook. You can nicely exploit their position. Rook takes, rook takes, bishop takes. Okay, so we have two bishops and a queen against two bishops and a queen. The main imbalance is what? King safety. We got a nicely defended king here for black. Maybe he plays h6 to give himself a loop to some air to breathe. Um, so his bishop doesn't have to rely, doesn't have to block the back rank. Um, and just that pawn on g4, it might be decisive. Because you could see things like queen e2 coming and hitting g4 and Phil training hitting b2. Yeah, a pawn on b2 with the bishop attacking. Well, he's got, he's attacking d7. But I think the combo of the open king and b2, g4, f2, a lot of weaknesses. And the bishops are both loose too. So what does Steinitz do here? I feel like he's going to just win on the spot almost. So he does queen e2. And now he's, yeah, now he's a forking. He's forking b2 and g4. He's threatening to take on g4 and fork the king and the bishop. So he has to go h3, but now he cedes b2 to the bishop, I think. First he kicks it, gives himself that important loop while he can. Oh, the bishop can take it, but you still take on b2. And then you can maybe take a3 later. Hmm, counterattacking the queen. I'm not sure. Now you've moved away from your attack on b7. You're allowing queen f3 now. And now we're hitting, uh, we're not getting b2, but we're getting h3. And then when you get h3, you're dropping g4. Everything's fine. Okay. What's going on here? Don't we have queen d1? Oh, he's, he's hitting the bishop. I think we have queen d1 check and bishop c6. Yeah, that's game. Because like, so white was relying on a counterattack. It's kind of like when they attack one of your pieces, then you go bishop b5 check and they go c6. Now you've got two things hanging. In this case, you had a piece hanging and a checkmate threat, or, or a mating attack threat. Not immediate mate, but it's, it's not pretty. Um, let's see how it goes down. We got queen check, bishop c6. Okay, yeah, it's not a mate threat, but but we're we're fully infiltrating. We're getting queen h1, queen, queen a, then queen g2. It's not looking good. He goes king h4, then we have bishop f6, I think. It's not over yet, but it's not, it's probably it's probably a winning something. So does he take on h6? No, he tries to cover. Maybe he was worried about queen d6. Hmm, that's no, not really a threat. Let's see. Ah, check. So does that, okay, does that change the evaluation after queen h1? So queen takes queen h1, king g2, queen g2, king f4, queen f3 mate, because we've decoyed the queen. If king h4, queen takes queen h1 check, king g3, queen g2 check, king h4, g5 check, king h5, queen takes h3 mate. Oh, he's gonna have to give up the bishop. Let's see. Let's see that line. So if takes, I 
think it's going to be, does this work? That might work too, queen f3. Otherwise, queen h1 and queen g2. But why let him run when you can catch him right there? But he's got bishop f1 anyway. You know, then you go queen takes f2. If he goes queen g3, then you made him on h1 because he blocked the entryway. That might be easier. Because even if he checks on uh, b8, you just go king h7, stop his checks. Yeah. That looks good to me. Again, if he goes here, you got mate. If he goes here, we have check and mate. Yeah, that should be it. So does he resign soon? So we have bishop e5 check. No, he doesn't take, he blocks. Can we even take on f4 or something? Yeah, still works. Well, now it's even worse because if you get if his king goes to h4, we got no g5. He still takes with the bishop though. So I assume we're going to go queen h1 and then queen g2 follow up. Ah, queen g1 finesse. Aha. Queen g2, then queen e1, queen g3, g5. So if he goes here, we're gonna draw. We're gonna draw the queen in front. So we get the nice. That's why it's important to go to g1. We draw the queen here, and then what do we do? We check. Even though bishop takes, it doesn't matter. You take back again, and then we get the queen. We we decoy the king. We remove the defender from the queen, and again. Wow, nice game. So now where are we? I think I'm gonna take a break here. I think I, I'm losing a bit of gas. I'm gonna take, I need some water. Um, so we looked at seven games. Um, yeah, great game. So, so far, what's the record? We have Zuckertort one, Steinitz one. Then we had Zuckertort, 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 Steinitz, Steinitz. So we're tied, right? No, no, not tied, it's been seven games. No, Steinitz pulled ahead, right? Yeah, that's where Steinitz pulled ahead. So we have uh, four to three, four to three, because we had, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because there was uh Steinitz had one, let's just count Steinitz, one. Yeah, you lost a bunch. So he only has three. Yeah, that four game streak by Zakator. Wow, that was powerful. That's really all he got out of it because the entire match was, 10 to 5. If, so they drew some more, and Zakator only got one more win after that. And Steinitz, as you can see, after those zeros, win win, we just saw. So now we're here, draw. Then we got a bunch of wins win, draw, win, win. He lost one, drew, drew, held it, held steady. Then he wins, draws, and then he finished off with just really proving that he earned that title. Okay, so, so in the next phase, I'll try to do every single game. At least we got to see the end of it. So that's coming next. All right. Hopefully you got something out of the initial games of Steinitz, one through seven. And let me know what you think about the World Championship match. Thanks and have a good night.